Last time I checked, it's still me, Tivan Naidu, from the National Business Initiative. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, the bosses say we can go ahead with the program, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to kick off. Um, I'm Tivan Naidu from the Social Transformation Unit of the National Business Initiative, the NBI. We've got a very exciting and inspiring program laid out, laid out for you for, in a short space of time. So I urge you to use this opportunity to share, to learn, to listen, and also to network amongst yourselves. So um, with that in mind, I just want to share with you uh, some quick housekeeping protocols I mentioned earlier, toilets up there. Um, on this side, there's a small meeting room. We understand that sometimes people have meetings scheduled online in between. Oopsie, it wasn't me. <laughs> um, there's a small meeting room here if you need to take a call or an online meeting, but just be aware it's not soundproof. So you'll have to keep your voice at whisper level if you need to do that urgently. Um, for the people that are online, I'm, I just want to let you know that on your platform, there's a, a space for you to throw up questions. We'll pick those questions up later. And when our panelists are ready, they will respond to them. So please use that function on your online platform, the Q&A function. And it's not just for questions, it's also for comments, because this is also a dialogue. Um, the other thing to, worth mentioning is that this event is being recorded. So you will have access, and our comms and events team, the NBI comms and events team, will um, assist you in how to get the recording and access it after the, the event is done. Um, the final thing is that we are live tweeting this event. If you look at the bottom, those are the hashtags. Once again, we urge you, we encourage you to please share uh, this event in your network using those hashtags. Uh, the, the program, as I said, is quite exciting. The people that we've got on our panels are very inspiring and very knowledgeable. So um, it's very useful for us to share widely the outcomes of this event. Um, on a last note, I'm going to ask our comms and events team to please stand up so that if you want any assistance from them, you know who to go to. Um, there's Nabila. Um, there's Amy at the back. There's Nombolelo at the back. Um, when you walked in, you met um, Sepisa. Sepiso, when you walked in, she was doing the registration. So that's our comms and events team. Now that you know who they are, um, what they look like, uh, please make use of them to assist you, with, especially with the social media profile. Um, we're going to kick off very quickly um, a brief overview of what we're going to do in the next few hours. Um, I'm going to hand over to one of our key partners. Uh, from SIPE, the Center for International um, Private Enterprises. Um, now, SIPE, together with Covington and the NBI, have been very instrumental in the past few months trying to put together this event. Um, it's very timeless, it's momentous. I mean, every, since the Zondo Commission has been out, everybody's been curious and wanting to know what next. So where we are at this moment with the partners that we've collaborated with, I think is very necessary, very timeless, and very important. So uh, we thank you for your time also to be part of this process. Um, I'm going to hand over to Lola, who will take us through a bit more of the context of why we're having this event. Lola will be online. She's in Lagos at the moment. Um, Dina, I'm going to, we're also using this platform as NBI to launch our ethical leadership and anti-corruption training course. Now the NBI, just a quick heads up on how we do what we do, is that we host, convene, facilitate dialogues like this, but we also run capacity building training, both in-house and generic work. And the reason for this is that we want to build deeper understanding and insight around the topics that we discuss and organize. So my colleague Tutula will take us through the nuts and bolts of that course. It's very exciting. 
Um, then we're going to move into the exciting panel discussions. We have drawn, selected, uh, very strategically individuals to be part of this panel. They come with years and decades of experience, knowledge, insight that I think is worth sharing in a forum like this. So I think we're quite um, privileged to be um, in this room to hear from these our esteemed colleagues who are going to be sitting on the, on the panel. It won't be just one way. There'll be opportunities for questions that you can raise and get a response from our panelists from their expertise and experience. Um, we have three panels. Uh, the first one is mainly around the risk and regulatory framework and landscape. This, when it comes to AML and anti-corruption, everybody wants to know. So what are the consequences? Usually the regulation and the legal framework is the first go-to port of call. So I'm hoping that we learn and get a lot more insight from our panelists on what, where we are in terms of the status quo when it comes to the regulatory environment. Um, the next panel discussion will explore more deeply around the public-private partnerships, not just in South Africa, but also in the region. And we'd like to highlight the importance of working together, the public sector and the private sector, to prevent money laundering and financial crime. So that panel will discuss more in depth. Um, we'll have a short break after the Q&A. The third panel focuses on now, what do we do? Now that we know what we know, what do we as business, as a collective, as a coalition, as a network, what do we do to take action, to take a stand? And this is a call, almost a plea, an urgent plea to the private sector to not be shy to coalesce, not be shy to network. And this is a call to action for you because money laundering, um, financial crime is endemic the depth the scale in our context is is not something that we is openly discussed and uh, but it has such a huge ne negative impact and mainly on the most marginalized and poor in our country so it's really really vital that we explore these public private partnerships and we also get deeper insight on how the AML and the financial crime weaves its way into our daily lives. So the final panel then, um, the final call to action will be led by another esteemed colleague of us, of ours, Professor JT Kosman. Each of our panelists will be introduced uh, briefly before they come on, so you get an idea of who they are, where they come from, and what expertise they carry. And, um, definitely how they're going to contribute to this discussion and the insights that we leave you with. So I thank you. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Lola Adekanya from the Center for International Private Enterprise, who's online. You can turn anywhere and you will see our online guests. In front, behind, on the side, they are with us. Lola, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Devan. That was uh, that was very helpful. Although I'm not in the room, I do feel like if I were in the room, I would know exactly uh, where to go if I needed anything. So thank you so much. Um, it's uh, it's a shame I can't be there in person. I was looking forward to being able to attend. Uh, unfortunately, with the craziness of our schedule, I'm here in Lagos. We have elections coming up. In a few days, I do have to be here and be on ground. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not there in person, but I'm very grateful uh, that, that I can join you virtually today. And, and I'm looking forward to the discussions that will follow. Um, so again, it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to this very important uh, leadership, uh, uh, thought leadership discussion um, organized by uh, very uh, brilliant partners, the NBI, the Basel Institute on, uh, of Governance, and, and Covington in Berlin um, LLP. Um, my job this morning is quite simple. It's really to set the tone for this conversation, um, which the van has started to do, um, and also to give you some context on the, the discussions that will follow. So I will try to uh, make it as simple as possible and, and go straight to the point. 
um, because I myself I'm looking forward to the discussions that will happen um, following uh, following this introduction. So the best place to probably start in in giving more of a context and setting the tone for this conversation really um, is to point to something that's already quite impressive to me. Uh, having worked in the anti-corruption space for almost 10 years, it is quite impressive for me to see uh, private sector partners. So the NBI, um, you know, a membership organization of private sector companies, uh, Coventry, a, a company, a, a firm, but a private sector uh, company itself, um, Cy, um, which is Cy is a global nonprofit that supports private enterprise around the world um, to promote and strengthen democratic institutions, um, and Basel, the Basel Institute. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see that these unorthodox collaborators come together to talk about something that uh, is usually not on the topic for private sector gatherings like this, and that's corruption and the issues of money laundering and illicit financial flows. I mean, usually when the private sector convenes, um, it's around issues directly linked to, you know, profit and growth and, and trade facilitation and, you know, economic strategy and policies and things like that. Um, however, you know, the business community for too long, having been passive actors in efforts to combat corruption, especially in Africa where the impact of corruption is all too well known, um, we have only really seen private se sector come to the table only as far as compliance is concerned. Um, interestingly, we have not even seen that much engagement in Africa uh, of the private sector in working with the public sector to come up with policies or procedures that helps uh, mitigate corruption. Um, I think one of the things that I recall very early on in my career is a private sector partner, a nonprofit, reaching out to a business association to collaborate with them on anti-corruption interventions. And the response was, we don't want to be seen as anti-government um, in a sense. Uh, unfortunately, it's no longer news to us in the region um, about the cost of corruption. It's often compared to you know, the, the, our GDPs, how much Africa is losing in terms of its GDP or budgetary allocations uh, to corruption or to illicit financial flows. And, and to put that in context, in South Africa specifically, between 2021 and 2022, it's estimated that the country lost about 1.7 billion US dollars uh, to corruption in healthcare procurement alone. Uh, and, and this accounts for about a third of the health budget of the country. And the estimate of you know, 10 to $20 billion being lost to illicit financial flows in the country alone, um, unfortunately also demonstrates what we've heard all too often um, about the, the impact of corruption in, in, in the country and in the region. Um, the high level report put together by the Tabonbeki uh, committee um, authorized by the African Union actually demonstrated that up to 62% of illicit financial flows that Africa loses um, comes from commercial activity. And so the passive role of the private sector in efforts to combat corruption has been, uh, is now being interrogated. How much more should and can uh, the private sector do? Um, we've now learned uh, that leaving the job of combating corruption and, and combating money laundering uh, to law enforcement alone um, is in itself not sufficient uh, for many reasons. The world over, most regulatory oversight agencies um, are really underfunded, and that's the case for Africa, you know, low, lower levels of capacity and funding uh, to really be able to um, prevent, detect, and respond effectively to a lot of the uh, corruption and money laundering risks that the, con the continent faces. Um, in addition to that, and, and this is less often discussed, uh, law enforcement is not as um, equipped to tackle corruption challenges from the carrot or the approach of incentives, um, which is something that you know the business community and the majority of citizens will respond to much better. So when you think about the carrot and the stick approach, uh, law enforcement is very well equipped um, to, to push forward the stick approach, which involves penalties and uh, investigations and, and punishments. 
but not as much um, in other innovative ways that encourages um, integrity. And that's really where the private sector comes in. In fact, uh, the perception that, you know, curbing corruption is the role of law enforcement alone or curbing money laundering is the role of law enforcement alone has really caused the stagnation of efforts to combat corruption in the region. Um, if anything, um, it has actually done worse. Uh, it has made combating corruption a lot harder and, and allowed co corruption to become a systemic challenge um, around, uh, around the world and in Africa particularly. And why do I say that? I say that because um, systemic corruption is caused by a deepened lack of trust in government systems, in institutions, when, which makes combating corruption harder. When majority of citizens have low trust and low faith um, in the governance systems and the institutions to actually check and mitigate corruption, um, unfortunately, it creates a cycle, uh, a corrosive cycle. And there's data from the OECD and Afrobarometer surveys that have shown strong correlation between trust in governance institutions and the perception of corruption uh, in, in, among citizens. The lower the trust in governance systems and institutions, the higher the perception um, of corruption. So really, systemic, systemically corrupt countries require a whole lot more than just law enforcement approach to tackling corruption. There must be concerted efforts across stakeholder groups um, you know, public sector, private sector, civil society, and other institutions working together to, to combat corruption in this country. What, one of the slides that I like to share to really demonstrate um, what happens where pri private sector and other stakeholders are left uh, on one side and then law enforcement is involved heavily in investigating and, and, and tackling corruption and even trying to prevent corruption. Um, what typically happens is, is, is this, and you know, permit me to share a slide that we've used to illustrate um, this discussion, quite interestingly, and, and you know, this, is, this is pretty much how, whether it's whistleblowers or it's a company trying to operate with integrity in a systemically corrupt setting, um, whether it's a civil society organization that's investigating corruption, this is the feeling where you know corruption looms larger than their ability to really make an impact in tackling corruption. Uh, this slide was developed by a partner of SIPES in Asia, but it's really been it's resonated a lot with our partners, you know, across many other countries in Asia. It was created in Thailand, it's resonated in Indonesia, in about 12 countries where we work in Africa, in Europe, and in Eurasia. And that's because in practice, um, Tackling corruption cannot happen unless there is uh, not just political will, but there is also business um, will to be accountable and business, you know, efforts and pressure to promote integrity beyond the one firm, but to the network of businesses in, in any community. The reality uh, is though that corruption is not an African problem. And, and I think it's important to say this, we may not say it often enough, it, it is a global problem, it's a problem, it, it exists anywhere there are humans, you know, there's social interaction. However, um, in Africa, the critical or urgency for private sector cooperation to tackle corruption is twofold. One, it's important now more than ever to cooperate to rebuild trust in government systems. Uh, tr trust in government uh, has taken a hit, trust in government institutions has taken a hit around the world, including even democratic systems have taken a hit around the world lately in recent times. Um, but in, in the region, uh, the, the impact of lower trust in government uh, has led to quite a few violent uprisings in our region. Uh, it continues to impact especially the poorer and lower income demographic in our countries, even though everyone suffers from, uh, from, from corruption and lack of trust in institutions. We've seen misinformation and disinformation, the rise of that. And unfortunately, when governments try to get ahead of problems um, that corruption has caused, 
uh, they, it, they don't get as much support from citizens as you would like. Um, a good example of when this hits home is, for instance, with the load shedding that uh, Thuvan was talking about, um, which really is an impact of corruption that has gone on for decades under previous administration, and now citizens have to deal with that, and the frustration of that makes it hard, uh, takes, pretty much puts a dent in the effort of building trust in, in government system. We see this also in Nigeria, we see this in East Africa. Uh, in Nigeria, there's talk about removing subsidies on oil products, and that has been a bane of corruption for a long time. And unfortunately, removing oil subsidies to citizens um, looks like taxing the poor to enrich the corrupt rich, um, even though it's supposed to be an approach to tackle corruption. So more than ever, there's urgency in really buckling down and asking the difficult questions. How do we support um, law enforcement? How do we support other stakeholders in civil society to tackle corruption? The second reason why it's really important and it's urgent now is this. As the global political economy is evolving, um, Africa is taking its place more and more in the global economy, including with the AFCFTA, which the Africa Free Africa uh, Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement taking taking place, uh, taking its place, or, or you know becoming a major instrument for political and economic um, engagement for African nations. The perception of a weak rule of law attracts less ideal investors and partners to any country. Uh, the effect of this is that the country, the countries with you know the weakest rule of law or perception of that or weak rule of law mechanisms, uh, become at the highest risk of attracting investors and partners with pretty much subpar democratic values, and and this could erode any efforts they've made in uh, uh, consolidating sustainable growth and democratic systems. So today's conversation, without further ado, is going to help us think about this. How do we work together, private sector, public sector, civil society? What efforts um, is needed to put, bring together um, to tackle corruption, to address corruption challenges in ways that does not pretty much take away the uh, primary role or responsibility of any of these institutions? What do I mean? Uh, you know, the goal of business is, is to make profit and to grow. Um, and how do we do that in a way that's sustainable, in a way that helps to reduce corruption and money laundering in our countries and in our region? This is where what we want to try to achieve with these conversations. CYP has done a lot of work on this, this uh, uh, on, on private sector approach to um, uh, tackling corruption. Uh, same thing with the Basel Institute has done a lot of work on this around collective action. We have lots of models around this and we're looking forward to this conversation leading us to the point where we can share some of these models and support efforts to work together to tackle corruption in South Africa uh, and in the region. So with that, I will uh, wrap up my quick remarks uh, and pass this conversation, this, the mic back to you, uh, Thevan. I wish you very um, interesting deliberations. I will be here listening and contributing as well. And uh, with that, I yield the mic and I thank you very much, NBI, uh, Covington, Basel, for uh, the excellent job of putting this together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lola. That was truly, truly insightful. I'm sure we all felt the same. Um, as much as you shared with us that this is a universal condition, there's also a context, specific context that's specific to certain countries, continents and regions. So thank you for highlighting that. Perhaps it's worth mentioning for those of you who don't know much about the NBI, um, a little bit, share a little bit about what the NBI is. And I think it links nicely to why we're here at this event and why we're discussing this. In 1995, our then president, Nelson Mandela had a vision of a transformed society. And part of that transformation involved a transformed private sector. It comes from the basis that um, democracy or up upholding democracy is not just the sole responsibility of government. It is a collaboration between the private sector, civil society and government and not just in one avenue. And that formed the basis of why the NBI was, was um, initiated. Um, today we have close to a hundred 
members, which is quite a milestone. It's significant. It shows the commitment of the private sector uh, to transformation, economic transformation, social transformation, environmental transformation. And I'm sure all of those, um, our members, as well as our team, are very proud to be part of this meaningful change process. This event on anti-money laundering and anti-corruption is located in our building trust and accountability pillar or program, if you like. Um, it is a culmination and consolidation of a lot of hard work and uh, expertise, experience that, that has come together to, to create um, solution findings, solutions that are Africa specific. Um, I mean, it's, it's poignant to mention, it's important to mention that South Africa in terms of the latest transparency international statistics as of 2022 sits at 72 out of 180 countries in terms of corruption. This is not something we can take lightly. It has feelers at, in every corner of our society and we feel it from the time we wake up um, in these days. So. Um, I wish now to um, hand over to my colleague Chutula to talk a little bit and deep dive us into this very exciting um, training course that's been developed by the NBI and I wish you um, enjoy this little session from us. Thank you. Chutula. Good morning, everybody, um, and thank you, Tevin. As mentioned, my name is Ututu Landunge. I am the program manager within the Social Transformation Unit at the NBI. I am tasked with the oversight of program and project implementation and management, and I have the absolute honor to take you through the NBI's ethical leadership and anti-corruption program. I'm excited today because it is, I've been part of the journey of this particular body of work. Um, ELAC, as we um, affectionately call it, the Ethical Leadership and Anti-Corruption Program, is positioned within the social transformation work, and um, it's within a pillar called Building Trust and Accountability. This particular pillar covers our ethics and anti-corruption work, and it aims to strengthen the relationship between business and broader society, in doing so by building trust and accountability, which requires an ethical and responsible private sector. I'd like to take a moment to quote um, in, well, quote from the State Capture Commission um, conference, understanding the findings and recommendations of the Zondo uh, Commission 2022 report, and it reads, corporate corruption should not be treated in isolation. The soil from which it grows tends, tends to consist of organizational culture, including bullying, harassment, gender discrimination, and a lack of diverse leadership. Confronting corruption in the private sector should therefore evolve sorry, pardon me, should involve a broader um, campaign against, a wider, against wider issues. Ethics education is needed. Which brings me to the purpose of the course in itself, to address the fast-growing culture and unethical behavior within the private and the public sector. And it's also important to um, mentioned the fact that this course captured the understanding that corruption is messy, it's tricky, it's um, complex and nuanced. You find organizations that are said and seen to be compliant and yet find themselves embroiled in scandal. How is this possible? What are the gaps? What are the gaps between systems, procedures and policies? What are the organizational um, aspects of perpetuating or curbing corruption. In attempt to answer this very question, the course um, looks at three thematic areas, being ethical leadership, organizational culture, and behavioral awareness. 
The course in itself is aimed at middle management, senior management as well, and um, is applicable to the private and public sector. It acts as a behavioral awareness and uh, education, pardon me, and, uh, and um, decision-making tool. Um, it's also study. It's also a case study based, looking at um, whistleblowing as part of the thematic areas. This is where we unpack what is whistleblowing and the hardships in which whistleblowers undergo. In particular, the uh, Cynthia Stimpel um, case study is looked through in this course, and. Um, it's a very interactive course with animation and videos. It's under 60 minutes long and provides an opportunity for assessment and self-reflection. And just looking at the infographic then, giving a little background around the course in itself, it is a direct response by the NBI to the Job Summit Framework, framework um, that um, the NBI committed to, to develop a comprehensive open online source platform that aims to interrogate the fast-growing culture of unethical behavior. The program has been designed to first understand the current existing platform and design an impactful training. The course development um, activities um, that were captured were landscaping, ethics and anti-corruption benchmarking, um, in-company research pilot, the transparency in corporate reporting, the track report um, and uh, curriculum development and developing of the open online platform. Where do we find this course? On the NBI's website as well as the Joe Slovo website. The program is supported, supports the uh, National Development Plan 2030, as well as the SDG, Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions. Once again, I would like to also say that um, none of this would be possible without our partners who walked the journey with us. KPMG, BLSA, Joe Slover Foundation, Amazon Web Services, as also our um, partners that we worked with in terms of developing the data points and pools that informed the um, course content and curriculum in itself, Corruption Watch and the Overseas Development Institute that helped us develop the, um, the content in itself. Thank you very much. Tutula, thank you very much. Um, I sort of oversaw um, a very deep gratitude to the following uh, partners that were part of building this course and making this body of work uh, possible and getting the ball rolling. Um, so it's worth mentioning the, the four organizations, namely Business Leadership South Africa, KPMG, the Joe Slover Foundation, and Amazon Web Services, who were part and parcel of putting this package together. I hope it has piqued your interest. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, exciting knowledge uh, that's located in the, in the training. Um, we are now going to move. Thank you for returning. Um, I hope you are energized and ready for the afternoon session. Um, we have an exciting panel again. Uh, it's going to be led by Scarlett. Scarlett, uh, please help me pronounce your surname. Vanevench. Scarlett Vanevench is from the Basel Institute in Switzerland. It's a global think tank um, at the forefront of um, reporting, corporate governance, and all issues dealing with um, governance. <laughs> I'm going to hand over the mic to Scarlett to Thank introduce you. the panelists and to take forward this next session, which is really focusing on the public-private partnerships when it comes to uh, working together around combating corruption and, and uh, money laundering. Thank you, Scarlett. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everybody, to panel two. But as we just heard, we will be moving on from sort of more the legislative realities in the region uh, and in South Africa, uh, more towards sort of what the call that we heard during the first panel and also the discussions earlier this morning about working more together 
how can the government and the private sector work more collaboratively to address some of these risks that we've identified. Um, we've also heard a little bit about sort of the cost uh, of illicit financial flows, of corruption, money laundering, etc. Um, and I think there's sort of two things can be true at the same time. One being that a lot has been done in terms of setting these international standards and getting the laws in place. We're looking at the Financial Action Task Force internationally, but also SMLR regionally. Uh, but still, we are fighting something that is quite substantive, I think. We heard some numbers earlier today, but I think in the, in the continent, it's, it's estimated around $89 billion leaving in illicit financial flows every year. And that's money that's missing for the development of, of many of those uh, jurisdictions and, and countries. Um, so I want to kind of take us back to the private sector and the role of private sector in this and where we are when we're talking about the role of private sector uh, to address illicit financial flows and money laundering. Uh, and I think the, uh, the latest uh, FATF compliance report really hits it, hits the nail on the head here and puts some very interesting numbers on this. Uh, and that is that uh, um, in the 120 countries they reviewed, 97% scored low uh, uh, to moderate effectiveness in addressing the money laundering uh, uh, risk and terrorist financing in the private sector. If you then dig a little bit deeper into that and you take away the large financial institutions, uh, it becomes that number becomes even higher because, of course, we all know that when it comes to banks and financial institutions, regulations have been in place for much longer. They're much more stringent. Uh, and, but of course, there are others, and we heard about sort of the gatekeepers, the lawyers, the accountants, art traders, etc., who are also involved uh, in that, who have really not stepped up to the plate here in this. Um, I also think it's very interesting whenever we look at these reports or actually uh, are involved in these discussions around sort of thought leadership on this topic, we always end up at the same at the same conclusion, and that is that it's a shared responsibility between the private sector and government to address and help identify it, uh, uh, money laundering risks, illicit financial flows. Uh, um, um, so it's sort of like it needs to be shared. Uh, what I think is missing a little bit is that next step. If we all agree that it's a shared responsibility that needs to be taken seriously by both sides, uh, then the obvious conclusion should be, uh, or, or at least priority should be, working together to develop those joint approaches uh, um, to actually translate that into practice and be much more efficient. We've also heard that it seems like we're always two or three steps behind the criminal networks when it comes to this. And I feel like actually bringing the private sector and government together in a, in a network itself that is able to identify much more effectively where those risks are and uh, um, address that accordingly. Um, so that is really what our panel is going to be all about today, because there are some very interesting examples of existing approaches in the region already uh, which bring together public sector and private sector to uh, better address these risks and identify uh, um, better ways of, of moving forward. So I don't want to take too much time uh, um, away, so I'll kick it off straight away by introducing my first panelist. We had a bit of a, a switch. Stefan could not make it, but it's fantastic to have Peter Alts here, who is a senior person uh, in the monitoring and analysis at the Financial Intelligence Center, the FIC here in uh, South Africa, uh, and um, he has been instrumental in setting up and building and operationalizing the, Southern Afri the South African Anti-Money Laundering Integrated Task Force, short summit. So we're really interesting to kick us off to just explain a little bit how that came about, how it's been implemented, and some of the sort of lessons learned uh, in the course of that. So over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to engage you all and, and have some discussions about financial crime. I think it's, it's our passion. We really want to fight financial crime and we need to take hands in terms of fighting financial crime. So, so let me take a step back and, and just share with those of you that don't know the Financial Intelligence Center. We are responsible to identify the proceeds of crime and, and working with law enforcement in combating money laundering and terror financing. So, so what is the, the source of our information? Typically, we, we have an AML CFT framework in South Africa where people need to comply with our legislation. And that generates a lot of information, what we call uh, financial intelligence. And that information gets submitted to us. And we need to analyze that information and then share that with, with our law enforcement agencies. So, so typically, we're getting about 80% of our reports from the 28 uh, domestic and foreign banks in South Africa. 
And if you do the calculations, we're getting around uh, 10 to 15,000 uh, suspicious transaction reports a week from, from the bank, uh, from the, the, the broader reporting community. So if you do the calculations, there's a lot of uh, technology that needs to be involved in the process. So to better understand, to take other data points, to analyze that information and take it forward. And I think, so let's step off from that. And I think let's address the elephant in the room, the gray listing. I'm not going to tell you what is going to happen. So this week, uh, we are currently at FATF in Paris, where our situation as South Africa has been discussed. So Friday night, 7 o'clock, we will know whether we've been grey listed or not. So let me just take a step back in terms of, of the grey listing. So there's two areas, and Scarlett referred to it. There's a technical compliance. Do we have the legislation in place? We're getting a tick. And there's a lot of uh, amendments being done, as been discussed by the panel earlier. And then effectiveness. Are we able to use that legislation to address financial crime in South Africa. And that's where I want to come to, to the work that we've created in Samlet and the reason for establishing Samlet. So we can move to the next slide. So if you talk about the uh, financial information sharing partnership, so this concept started around 2015 by the Financial Action Task Force globally where they ask countries to work more closely. And there's various reasons. So what is our reason, South Africa, we, why we've started the partnership and working as a collective? First of all, money flows. I mean, it's very difficult for law enforcement to detect, to, to detect money flows. We recently work on a case, which is 150 million government tender. When you start following the money, we ended up 1,500 bank accounts through six banks. And, and it's very difficult for law enforcement to follow that money. So we need to work with the private sector in getting that information and start following the money. And then the issue about money laundering not be pursued, that's one of the recommended actions from FATF. To say South Africa only prosecute people for financial crime for fraud or corruption, but we don't prosecute the person for money laundering. And the other issues, we don't prosecute the enablers of money laundering. So a person that allows, for, for instance, if a bank allows a person to abuse his system or an attorney is helping a, a, a money laundering, that person is an enabler. So we need to up our game in terms of, of prosecuting money launderers. And I think I'm going to jump to number four immediately, technology. There was discussions earlier about uh, cryptocurrencies and understanding the technology, the technology. There's a lot of emerging trends in terms of financial crime. So sharing and working together as a partnership, we, we better understand the technology around crime and how do we better detect that. And then the limited recoveries, fact of estimate 1%, less than 1% of proceeds of crime has been recovered um, in terms of law enforcement efforts. So we need to work jointly as a collective with the private sector to, to be able to detect these proceeds. And I think the last issue I want to make in terms of resources, I mean, the, the issue was discussed earlier. We, we can't increase, keep on increasing our resources. Working together with the banks as, as a collective in, in Samlet, we're able to, to, to get some inputs and some, some work being done by them, which can then feed into our further processes. We can move to the next slide. So just to, to, to explain to you the current um, financial information sharing partnership that we have in South Africa, we have on the left side, mostly the banking sector, because 80% of our reporting is coming from the banking sector. Um, and we have a public private partnership. We have established Samlet, the South Africa Money Laundering Integrated Task Force, which allows us to collaborate with the banks. And I will get in more detail later. Then we have the public private, uh, public, public partnerships. So we're sitting with all of this information as the Financial Intelligence Center, but what are we doing taking that information to law enforcement? So we've created some relationships, created some, some structures. We created in, in 2020, we've created a fusion center at the Financial Intelligence Center. The fusion center allows us to work as a collective. We're having the information, we can hand it over, they can start working on these cases. And some of the successes around the fusion center, the fusion center initially started to work on, on COVID-19 relief, uh, efforts, so crimes related to that space, and we've uh, up to now we've preserved 1.9 billion in terms of, of monies was paid out by government for tenders that was not supposed to happen. So a lot of um, successes based on partnerships that we've created. We can move to the next slide, please. So this is the the Samlet uh, 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 architecture currently as we have it. We we call it the South Africa Money Laundering Integrated Task Force. And you can go and read up RUSI, the Royal Institute for Security uh, Studies, done a lot of uh, work around uh, public private partnerships across the world. And South Africa has been mentioned in, in some of those research documents. So there's about 28 of, of these uh, concepts or these models 
internationally. Membership, we have from government, we have the Financial Intelligence Center, the Reserve Bank, um, because they're supervising the, the banking community. Then we have the private sector, we have the Banking Association of South Africa, BASA, SABRIC, um, and then all the major banks, as I indicated, 28 uh, domestic and foreign banks currently in South Africa. And then the two streams of work that we're trying to focus this, the efforts of SAMLET is working uh, on a strategic level. So where we do research, what is the current trends in terms of financial crimes? How do we, what is the, the red flags? What is the indicators? What is the typologies around this so that we better detect these crimes in the banking system, but also as the Financial Intelligence Center, when we mine our data, we have the ability to, to identify these matters much easier. And then we have a structure which is referred to as tactical operations groups, where we work on specific investigations. And one of the examples here is the, the, the work of the Fusion Center, where we focused on COVID-19 relief funding from government and work as a collective in terms of sharing financial intelligence. Then we have a number of expert partners which helps us with data sharing, getting all of the information in. Because in this game, you need to have a lot of data and points in terms of, of understanding your, your data much better. So ultimately, we want to detect, I mean, so, so be more proactive. We want to prevent financial crime, so doing awareness sessions. Uh, when we, we disrupt financial crimes, to have successful prosecutions. When you talk about the, the Fusion Center, of the 500 cases in the Fusion Center, we have already 100, more than 100 cases in a court process. I mean, some of those cases are going to court and we get, the people get prosecuted for what they've done in terms of, of financial crime. So let's move, and I, I'm conscious of the time, I don't want to take too much time of the other panel members. So we can move to the next slide, please. So this is some of the expert working group that we're currently busy with, and, and we will grow in terms of when we identify new trends or new emerging threats in terms of financial crime, we'll do more research. So some of the issues are illegal wildlife trade. We've already issued a, a report. You can go online and, 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 um, and, and Google that. You will find the report. And, and some of the, the red flags that we've identified. Who is this individual? What are they involved with? What type of products are they using? So how do they pose a risk to your, to your business? In modern slavery and human trafficking, the report will be issued in the next two weeks. Corruption, a topical issue, the Zonder Commission, all of these things are happening. A lot of work has been done. The report, we suspect, by the end of March will also be released. And, and a lot of work has been done. So, so we will have a phase two in terms of, of corruption, which is all about identifying the networks all about identifying the political exposed people, the people that's inf infiltrating it, that's um, managing the, the tenders. The threat of terrorism, we, we know there's, there's some issues around that, serious narcotics, drugs, and then lastly, tax evasion. So there's some, some new topics that we're going to soon introduce and do some joint work on that. So just we can just move to the next slide and I will, I will jump through this slide, because this will give you an example or a flavor of the work that we've done with the banks. I mean, if, if we as, as the government was working alone, we wouldn't be able to do this work. But working with the banks and getting some data from them, getting some researches from them, assisting us, understanding that engaging with the international community, we were able to understand this crime much better around the illegal wildlife trade. And as I said, the report is online. Um, you, you can refer to that. Let me stop here, Solid. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Am I back on? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for giving us this really quick overview about uh, the concept uh, of SAMLED and the implementation. And of course, it is within the region, sort of the first example of this at, at that level of, of implementation. So I think also seeing as we are not just looking at South Africa, but also towards the region, I think a very interesting example. And we'll get back to a little bit about the lessons learned and the story of what that implementation uh, um, ha has looked like. Uh, I just wanted to maybe uh, add one thing here about sort of money and, and, and money moving out of the certain jurisdictions and the work that comes after. Many of my colleagues work on asset recovery internationally. So, uh, you know, with these areas where the money is sort of kept, obviously we're HQ'd in Switzerland, so uh, um, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, you know, there's an obvious connection there. But just to say, following their work as well, it is unbelievably difficult to return assets. It is incredibly technical, it's very political, um, and it's a huge amount of money that's involved in being able to do that. So the priority should always, always be try to stop 
the money flowing out of the country by whatever means possible in the sense of in obviously connecting those dots between the private sector and government being an, an essential potential tool. Uh, um, and of course, the sort of trust building, I think we'll be talking about that later, what, what that experience has been like. But I would like to bring in, we've now had a little bit from the government's perspective, the private sector uh, or the financial institutions. Uh, and with that, I would like to connect to my second panelist, uh, um, Yanis Garakis, who works for the first RAND group, uh, which is an international uh, bank, uh, um, HQ here in South Africa, and uh, um, he's sort of managing the detailed analysis as part of the group's enhanced due diligence efforts, and as part of that has been involved uh, in Samlet, and so I'd like to hand over uh, to him to hear a little bit more about his experience from the private sector side of, of why they wanted to engage in this type of public-private partnership and what that experience has been like. So over to you, Yanis. Uh, thanks, Scarlett. Uh, can you just confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, thanks again for the invitation. Um, I think really um, to some of the points perhaps that uh, Peter made uh, as one of the larger financial institutions within South Africa, it was really uh, integral to, uh, I suppose, uh, our uh, approach on financial crime that that we were very much part and parcel of the uh, Samlet makeup. So, um, you know, I think if you can kind of split the last five or six years into different portions, you know, sort of pre-COVID, there was, um, whilst there was active participation by the banks and certainly rallying around the efforts in terms of the, uh, I suppose, the avalanche of cases that were coming out of state capture, um, you know, when you kind of then look at the period that followed in terms of um, COVID-19 um, and perhaps the formalization of the, the fusion center and the coordination of efforts through Samlet, um, we really saw a marked increase in terms of our ability to coordinate our um, affairs through Samlet. Um, you know, having the FRC as that central node to communicate to really helped us as a bank and the banking community to um, share information. Um, it also provided us um, uh, better access, I think, to our sort of industry colleagues and certainly brought us closer to some of the MOs that were more predominant in the market. Um, uh, I think particularly, and, and to Peter's point, um, although uh, during COVID uh, and, and through the establishment of the Fusion Center, those largely dealt with um, COVID-19 and the abuse of uh, perhaps government funding. Um, you know, those issues were widespread and, and predicate offences ranged um, across a series of different uh, types of offences uh, across the last, uh, I suppose, three or four years. Um, I mean, interesting just to, to note there that, that our participation as banks through Samlet took uh, multiple different um, forms. So the one that, that Peter alluded to was probably the expert working groups where we form uh, industry panel bodies, there's research that uh, contributed through all the different banks that contribute to the, the uh, submission of various, uh, I suppose, papers and, and industry thought pieces, which can guide the community. Um, the second is, um, you know, something which we have called TOGS or tactical operation groups, which, which meet on a regular basis to discuss some of these um, particular focused areas. So, for example, we have one on COVID-19, and, and that has been running successfully for over two or well, since the beginning of COVID, I guess so it's probably closer to three years now. Um, and really what we do there is we discuss prominent uh, cases between ourselves as member banks, um, and we then contribute information via a back and forth using a mechanism in terms of, um, uh, you know, information sharing between ourselves and the FRC, as well as um, based on certain legal provisions within that community itself. And, and I think, uh, you know, Scarlett, I think really what what has changed in the space is that our proximity to um, particularly to to our, our banking partners, as I said previously, but also to the FRC, uh, has made it that much easier for us to collaborate on where we are seeing cases that are perhaps unfolding in front of our eyes. Um, you know, this 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 enhanced collaboration has enabled us to share that much quicker, and there were some really you know, I suppose fantastic stories that, that came out of um, as, as much as it was a huge learning curve for the way that government dispensed of those funds, there were some great stories around preservation. You know, you raised the issues around how difficult it is to track flows once they have left 
uh, a country, but but I think it also goes for you know it's, it's similarly difficult to to get those funds back once they have left a bank, and there were I think really some very good stories around um, collaborating on live cases during COVID-19 where um, you know ourselves as as one of the banks would and I think Peter was was part of those calls where through active participation in live matters uh, that was really enabled through this initiative. We were we were able to secure funds on particular high-profile cases during COVID-19, um, and and you know why that's important is because I think we had come from this era of really chasing after cases where, you know, we were now waiting for potentially prosecution, we were waiting for preservation orders to be issued in court, etc. These were cases where we knew that uh, the money had was or either had been paid or was about to dispensed from various different accounts uh, and we as the bank had some of that exposure and because of because of our ability to engage with the FRC we were able then um, to uh, you know really collaborate effectively and try and preserve some of those funds in in I suppose as close to a live state as, as we have seen it in this space um, you know I, I think you know as an indication um, and and Peter I'm sure will agree with this but you know during the state capture period sorry probably about 2016 to 2019 or early 2020, we, we had active participation uh, with the FRC on a regular basis. Um, I think post, post COVID and the, and the identification or the formation of the, the fusion center, that collaboration probably increased, I'd say three to four fold. Um, you know, I was speaking to normally Peter and some of his colleagues on a weekly basis. That would often be sort of once a month prior to that. And 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 it wasn't just for the sake of these these um, having these meetings. These were active cases or participation that we were guarding as as one of the one of the banks. I think our, it's fair to say that our colleagues from the other banks were doing very similar things. And I think you know, Scarlett, one of the good points is that we formalised now some of that in terms of working models. That that perhaps as a as a bank, we we tried to introduce as 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 part of our approach during. The COVID-19 uh, sort of uh, pandemic and and how we would combat uh, illicit flows and we've now adopted in the EWG in terms of a model of uh, better fast tracking. So, Scarlett, I'm happy to perhaps just share that model on the screen if 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 that's okay with you. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, just bear with me. Uh, can you see that? Not yet. Okay. Yes. Can you perfect. see it now? Yep. Perfect. All right. Great. So, so on the left-hand side, you can see um, obviously ourselves as first round and, and our and our partner banks uh, on the left-hand side, and um, you know this is really some of the the model that we undertook to to try and enhance or or uh, perhaps improve perhaps the distance or the the level of collaboration. So, so effectively, the way this would normally start is that a bank, a member bank, or or uh, you know as Peter said. Another reportable institution would log an STR or a suspicious transaction report. Um, you know, effectively, the, the 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 amount of information that is contained in that STR alerts the Financial Intelligence Centre um, to a particular suspicion that a, that a that a member institution may have. Uh, you know, to Peter's point, that, that, you know, there are sort of 11 to 15,000 of these logged every week. So you can imagine it is a bit of a needle in the haystack for the FRC to try and pick out the prominent ones. What we would then do is we would then follow that up. Um, with an email um, to the FRC um, and we would attach the detail of the STR as well as the STR reference and we would notify the FRC that in fact we had exposure to this particular incident. We had some banked um, flows which we had already identified and we wanted to engage the FRC on a targeted basis so as to share that information. Normally what they would do is prompt a meeting between ourselves and the FRC on an urgent basis um, and depending on the extent of the information and perhaps how how, the, how valuable the FRC felt that information would be to the future investigation of the fusion center, they would then coordinate a meeting between ourselves and and that that those that uh, fusion center bodies on the right. So that would could include, uh, you know, the NPA, um, you know, the more specialized uh, Hawks uh, uh, division, uh, the SIU. 
the stifling revenue service, uh, etc. And and effectively, um, you know, what that would then allow is a, an open conversation with those partners on a case which we were busy with. And although although this is something which you know before we formalised it in a model and we we I suppose we promoted it through the EWG. It's something that we were doing as part of our day to day um, as first strand in, in trying to combat this. And we really felt it would be a valuable initiative to try and, I suppose, yield uh, or, or leverage for our partners also to benefit from. And, and hence, we promoted it through the EWG. But I suppose in a nutshell, Scarlett, I mean, this really gave us the the the, the leverage or, or the ability to, to share information quickly. Um, we saw the results on, on a couple of high profile cases where we were able to to coordinate efforts uh, quicker and 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 I think you know in reality we we improved the relationship between our between our partners both within the private sector and um also within uh, the FRC as well as the fusion center so so yes it yes it does uh, allow or rely on certain legal provisions around the sharing of information you know you need to make sure that those things are done properly but you know once those things are affected we really saw, um, you know, effective and reliable um, information sharing on a, on a rapid basis, which, which I, I suppose we're really happy to say had a good result in this instance. And sure, we've we've still got a lot of work to do around, you know, to some of the points previously raised around, you know, always being two steps behind. But but you know, there's certainly some good success stories if you listen to some of the number the numbers that Peter was talking about in terms of preservation. So, I think for us, you know, the the you know some of the things which we're now thinking about is obviously more proactive identification of some of these schemes. If you think about the relief, uh, sort of the release of relief funding now on, on potentials on, on the state of disaster, you know, we are really applying our minds along with the FRC to what what will that look like? What will those funds be spent on? And how as a bank and a banking community can we get more actively involved in making sure that there's, there's that we prevent further abuse? So, um, yeah, Scarlett, I mean, that's just a high level uh, from from uh, uh, perhaps from a first hand perspective and and some of the examples that that we've collaborated on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yanis, uh, so much for giving us a bit of a deep dive in terms of what that looks like uh, for the banks. I just wanted to think two things with uh, that really struck me in terms of outcomes and benefits. Sometimes this, this can seem very technical to people who are not working in financial institutions, but I feel like the underlying impact becomes quite clear as you talk about it. And one major thing there being that, as we were saying, the being two steps behind, but if you can demonstrate, for example, during the COVID situation, which was an unforeseen situation, and having those platforms and having a certain level of established trust between financial institutions and the government, that you're going to be much better equipped to handle uh, those situations. And I've worked with many different types of initiatives uh, in the region, but also beyond, uh, where they could all demonstrate that they were much better equipped to address corruption, corruption risks, money laundering risks during COVID because they've set up those platforms and those, those engagement sets. So I think that's a really interesting sort of point to take away of sort of like slowly getting ahead of, ahead of the game there uh, um, and also sort of like shifting that perspective. Maybe one question back to you from my side. Um, um, banks engaging with law enforcement is always an interesting relationship uh, um, and not always one uh, that both sides are super excited about engaging initially. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what that journey has been like in terms of going from sort of looking at maybe law enforcement as the ones trying to come after you to uh, looking at them as a a potential partner uh, um, and sort of building that trust and what experience uh, has been like. Uh, yeah, sure, sure, Scarlett. Sorry, is that um, so? So from our side, I mean, I think, um, and Peter can probably attest to this, is that we've always seen law enforcement as, I suppose, the coal face of some of these investigations. And uh, you know, from a first-hand perspective, um, we've tried to take a view that. We know that we have information which can assist the authorities and law enforcement in this instance, um, and we know that the the barrier to more effective investigation is the speed at which they get this information. So, we've we've one of the ways or one of the measures or the the reasons for trying to adopt this model is is if we can speed that up, if if we can get that information to law enforcement quicker, you know, if we can take out the barriers around. How this information is shared and, and making sure that we still um, obviously sort of abide by the legal provisions. We know that that you know obviously you know you talk about financial investigations, you talk about anti-money laundering. It's always 
following the money and 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 you know the banks certainly have have good tools to do that um from a first hand perspective normally where we have detailed investigations or insights our first thought is is more about how we can share that information quicker um so so it's never really been a um an issue for us in terms of overcoming any challenges about working with law enforcement it's more about how do we how do we get there sooner uh, because because it it only takes a second to transmit a payment or for money to flow um so speed is of the essence and and really what we're trying to do is speed that mechanism up so where we've got the insights how do we share them and how do we make sure that we're doing that within the letter of the law and then how do we i suppose refine and improve that model going forward so that the next time um you know funds are released on an on an emergency procurement or a or a, or a particular um emergency how do we make sure that we to your point slightly ahead of the curve then and hopefully prevent further abuse thank you thank you it's good to hear that uh there was a good working relationship from the start so maybe handing it back over to peter to to tell us a little bit about how maybe samlet has evolved uh but also uh um some of the hurdles and sort of what that process has been like of sort of implementing and, and keeping uh, this engagement going uh, and obviously building in terms of effectiveness uh, and impact as well. Yes, maybe if, if you can go back to my slides um, and I think um, we, we can just maybe talk about the, some of the benefits. Um, and, and previously when, when we had the, the relationship with the bank and the, the AML framework, we, we've seen a transaction being reported, but now having the ability to engage and, and giving some context to an investigation and, and, and more background, we, we, have, we have seen more complex uh, analysis been coming through. And one of the examples I gave you earlier about this, this specific government tender, uh, it went to eight different banks and, and 1,500 bank accounts. So, so putting all of that data together, um, you, need to have, you need to have the banks and, and working with you as a collector. Um, another thing that we are seeing, and, and not <clears throat> uh, uh, related to corruption, but other crimes, so for, for instance, the illegal wildlife crime, is that financial intelligence didn't play an important role in this investigation. So the walk to the investigator around a poacher and look at the, the guy being, being arrested with the, the horns in his possession. But, but now we, we started getting financial intelligence from the institutions and sharing that with law enforcement so they understand the syndicate so who's the network in the syndicate? Who's benefiting behind the transaction? So, so having that uh, ability. Um, we've recently seen, for, for instance, for illegal wildlife trade, a successful money laundering prosecution, which we haven't seen before. And again, it's because of, of uh, the, the banking community, understand the crime, understand the value chain, who's involved, what, what is this, the sector, how has it been operating, and, and sharing some of that, that information. Um, in terms of communication, we've seen a, a huge increase in communication. As, as uh, Janus indicated, we have the ability to, to set up a tactical operations group very early. And we try to be more proactive. If we picked up a media report, we, we have a discussion, and, and the banks will go back, and the FRC will go back in their data systems and start seeing whether we have exposure and see how do we then go, how do we take the matter forward. And we have the ability to gain the, the law enforcement agencies. So they are able to give us the scope, the period that they investigate. So we're having all of those things. Um, yeah, I think, and, and, and just, just some of the learnings um, in terms of, of, of what we've seen is um, government cannot fight crime on its own. We need, we need the private sector to work with us. Um, I have been just submitting one report on our website in terms of a suspicious transaction or submitting multiple reports or submitting thousands of reports we need the, the hands of, of um, the private sector to, to help us in terms of the fight against financial crime. And also when you take up a client, I think there was the issue about KYC that was discussed earlier. So how do we take that person in the financial sector or in the financial system? Do more due diligence around that individual. I mean, if there's some, some issues around that individual, report that to, to the financial intelligence center. And then what we've also seen in terms of the partnerships, you start building trust. I mean, initially we, we've shared some, some limited information, but the more you start working as, as a collective, and it takes some time. I mean, um, if you think about it, we started the, the, the Samlet in 2019, it was when we, we had our mutual evaluation, and we realized we, we, we can't see uh, effectiveness in terms of laundering. 
So, so it takes some time from that until now to, to build that uh, trusting relationship. Um, and, and you need to have somebody that leads the partnership. I mean, it's not to say I'm telling you what to do, but I lead the partnership in telling and making people accountable. So if I, if I have this research project, I have certain timelines. This is when we start, this is when we end, and this is how we deal, and this is how we're going to disseminate the information. So you need the agency or, or a, 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 to be either from the private sector or the, the, the government to lead this. And you will see all of the expert working groups, we've asked the, the banks to lead that. So, so it's not only about and dependent on the FIC and what we are doing, but it's dependent on, on all of us as a collective working, uh, working together. The last point I want to make um, is we need to recognize each other and we need to um, share successes. So if there's a success on a case, we want to, to make sure that we are recognized to say, this case that we have some successes, it was only the work of the FIC. The banks assisted, it received the intelligence, asset forfeits are worked on this matter, the special investigation work, so, so that we collectively um, acknowledge people and we share the success amongst ourselves. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you, um, Janis. We're now for the sort of final uh, part of the session. We're moving away from the uh, financial institutions to um, a different sector uh, that maybe perhaps hasn't had quite as much attention, but is extremely important when it comes to illicit financial flows and money laundering, and that is the real estate sector. And we also will be moving out of South Africa. So if we can get uh, the final uh, speaker on, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Anita Mancambo, who's the Director for Compliance and Prevention uh, at the Financial Intelligence Authority in Malawi. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, she let me know that there's, um, they have some trouble with the internet connection. Um, so, you know what, in the interest of time, maybe I can give a, a sort of bit of a quick overview uh, because I do think it's, it's important to, to counterbalance to not only look at the financial institutions who are much more developed, but also talk about some of those other stakeholders that have a really important role to play and obviously are also connected through the financial institutions there. And then sometimes um, sort of fairly low impact initiatives and in engaging with the financial uh, uh, intelligence agencies and the relevant private sector industry group can also be quite impactful without having to set up sort of a, a huge uh, and very sophisticated partnership such as Samlet. Uh, um, and in case we're not getting her, I'll just do my very best to summarize, <laughs> seeing as I have been uh, connected with her and working on this, <laughs> I will do my best. And that is that um, in Malawi, there's a lot of uh, pressure and, and illicit money coming in from neighboring countries. Uh, I'm not going to name names, uh, but, you know, high level connected to politicians, etc. And they're all uh, investing in the real estate market. Uh, now, the problem that the FIA identified uh, uh, following on from that was ultimately really that it's not professionalized. The real estate market, the way it was set up, uh, was so burdensome in terms of actually uh, getting licensed uh, that a whole dark... <laughs> Uh, um, um, group of, of real estate agents popped up that were not licensed, that were not officially registered, and they were actually dealing with pretty much everything uh, when it comes to real estate in the country. Um, so a sort of low-hanging fruit, and they started engaging with these real estate agents uh, to discuss what the problem is and what was being required, and they found that actually the requirements made no sense uh, um, and uh, in terms of what people were actually needing to do to address some of these risks. So the idea there is to really professionalize uh, uh, the industry um, together with the real estate agents. So not against them to kind of just push uh, notions of you need to do this, 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 and that, which is which was the previous approach, but really connect with them to see uh, um, how to ensure that this remains a thriving industry group, but while still addressing the money laundering uh, risks there. So ultimately, they're currently working through what we call a collective action, an anti-corruption collective action, with them to identify uh, um, what are the appropriate policies uh, that need to be uh, implemented. Um, and they've already seen some pretty incredible uh, results as a part of that. It's an ongoing uh, um, um, approach, uh, but I think it's a very interesting one to highlight that sometimes you don't have to move the mountain uh, um, in order to have, to, to, to have an impactful engagement. And sometimes, you know, there really is the red tape uh, and some of those requirements that are simply 
no longer uh, reflecting the times and the needs of certain industry groups. And that it's not just the, 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 you know, the responsibility of the government to come in with knowing everything and telling private sector what to do, but really step up and saying, let's do this collaboratively, let's have an engagement uh, and a conversation with that. So it's so very unfortunate that Anita cannot be here with us today, but I hope I didn't do too bad of a job in summarizing this very briefly. Uh, and I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions uh, for the panelists that are still able to be on. Um, and maybe I would like to kick it off taking it again a little bit out of this context and looking at the regional one and saying of course a lot of the the banks that are part of samlet uh don't just work in south africa they work regionally or even internationally uh and so just having that question uh as a, an intro question there of where both peter and also Yana see opportunity uh seeing as you're working uh, regionally of kind of like what does it take to kind of have this type of a model or approach to kind of go from one country to much more of a sort of regional uh, approach to really make sure that those loopholes are closed much more effectively? And do you see any opportunities uh, for that sort of in the next coming months and years? So maybe I can hand over to Peter, seeing as you're already on. Thank you so much. Um, so if I can just jump beyond one, thanks. Um, so, so South Africa is part of ESAMALAC, Eastern and Southern Africa Money Laundering Integrated uh, Task Force, which is a FATF style regional body. So, so in terms of our engagement uh, at, at uh, ESAMALAC, uh, recently we decided to take one of the projects um, that we have in SAMLAC to, to ESAMALAC. So the illegal wildlife trade project we've, we've taken to, to ESAMALAC. Uh, it was adopted by ESAMALAC to say, um, let's see what was the learnings from South Africa and let's go back and check in, in our own country what is the issues that we are seeing in terms of our national risk. So is the illegal wildlife trade a problem in, in my country and then also see how do we how do we best leverage and benchmark in terms of the, the private the public private partnerships that was created. So again, I mean, if you look at the models across the world, uh, the public private partnerships that was created or that were created. Um, it depends on your country. So do you want one that deals with strategic information sharing or one on tactical information sharing? So again, it will depend on, on those countries what, what type of model they will adopt um, in, in their jurisdiction. So, so the, the, the model was adopted at, at SMLAC. Um, and, and I think in April, there's an upcoming meeting where we will also end up a concept document in terms of of scoping the project and seeing how do we how do we roll out this this specific project in the region and and how do we not only do this project but also creating some some public private partnerships in the region because I, I think there's a lot of value having these type of partnerships and, and working as a collective with your reporting sectors or your reporting regime in in your different um, in your different jurisdictions we've also established what we call a heads of analysis forum between the 19 countries in the in the region and in that forum, we also discussed the issues of, of uh, public-private partnerships and sharing some of our experience. Again, it will depend on that country whether they want to take it forward and, and whether, what, what type of model will they implement and will they, will they take some of the learnings from, from, from South Africa. We, we've done similarly. When we started in 2019, we looked internationally what is type of the, the type of models that was available and, and then also looking at, at our current situation, what, what is our risks and, and where do we focus on in terms of having the, the most impact on that? So, so typically those type of experiences we are sharing with, with the region. We have received a number of invites to, to go and present in these countries. Uh, and typically when we get an invite either from the bank side, we will take the, the FIU. And, and if we go receive it from our side, we'll make sure we take the banks with. So that we can show in terms of the, the, the collaboration, that we work as a collective. It's not a once uh, one uh, a partnership that's been run by one uh, uh, institution we, we work as a collective so so we had a number of these engagements with our neighboring countries and, and selling the the concept to them because working as a collective we, we're just going to be more effective around financial crime thank you yeah, it's, it's great to see that it doesn't always have to be the same approach but it can also be certain topics that can be picked up on a regional level um i think just in the interest of time uh and we can bring janice in a little bit later let's take some questions uh so we don't miss out on that
Thanks. Thank you. Even the mic looks shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. That was really interesting. I and mean, clearly, data, access to information, and the whole value chain of knowledge is very important in the work that you do. I'm sure people are really um, uh, have a sense of urgency to want to learn more and know more, and especially around the partnerships. Um, in this session, I think it's, it's fair that we take a couple of questions from the online participants. So if the comms and events team can just bag up a couple of questions from the online group, please. We have one here. Yeah, oh, lovely. Thank you. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, we've, won, we've got one question from Sandra Kabaya. Uh, is it possible to partner with you and what are the requirements? Uh, dot, 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 AML Zimbabwe. Do you want to respond now? I'll hand that over yeah, to Peter. Uh, yeah, so, so I mean, can I, I can use this. Um, so, so, yeah, it's quite interesting because we, I, I traveled to Zimbabwe, I think it was in October or November last year. And, and uh, the FIU, the Financial Intelligence Unit in, in that country, had a event which they um, promoting the public-private partnership. So we've also shared in that um, some of our experiences in terms of, of what we are doing, how did we establish what was required, um, how did we get buy-in, and, and what were some of the impact that we are seeing so far. So now we, we can definitely reach out um, and, and we will make our contact details available and see how do we take hands and how do we take it forward. Um, there is some initiatives uh, ongoing in, in, um, in that country in terms of, of uh, taking uh, the public power parties forward and to be more impactful in terms of, of uh, AML CFT. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the interesting session. I'm Cynthia Stimple. I have a couple of questions and um, I'm actually quite pleased to see the amount of work and collaboration that has um, come from this working with banks and partners that can uh, work together to combat um, money laundering and corruption. So the first question is how successful have you been or in prosecuting the banks that have been implicated in the Zander Commission report. All the bank, all four major banks have been implicated and has any investigations, further investigation for prosecution been done against them. I know that the banks are an entity, but there are um, the board members, executive members who actually signed the documents, who are complicit in the agreements and what has happened there. Thank you. Um, the next question you had there, which was around VAT evasion. Would you consider working with companies like the Whistleblower House um, and organizations like Outer Corruption Watch and various others that are working with whistleblowers and picking up the level of corruption? I've come across banks in my organization and private sector who are evading tax. Obviously, our goal and role is to assist the whistleblower, and so we're not um, investigating. So can we pass those type of transactions on to you? And then I think yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Peter, I think it's back to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, I think the I, uh, question of banks and prosecution sure, no, is no, no problem. Um, so, yeah. so if you look at the, the Zonda report, um, there's, there's four recommendations in the Zonda report that pertains to the work of the Financial Intelligence Center. So we need to do a what they call a review um, of, of whether the banks did pick up the transactions and where they've reported it. 
and then whether um, and 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 the review team also need to look at whether the FIC then uh, took up that reports and and then produce it to law enforcement and then the, the last part is whether law enforcement did take that information and take it forward in terms of investigations so we've we've appointed an independent law firm um, that's running that review you can imagine uh, it's quite a, a lot of work if you look at the amount of data um, so looking at, at reporting matching it up with the reports we mentioned in the in the state capture report and and uh, matching it uh, up with the, the intelligence reports that was issued by the financial intelligence center to to the law enforcement community and then uh, following up with law enforcement where they've taken that forward and just to give you a rough uh, of uh, idea we from the FRC we issue around 3,000 financial intelligence reports annually to our law enforcement community so a lot of work has been happening in in the space but um, let's allow the review to, to, to play up and then they must make certain recommendations there's a project management office set up um, by the department of uh, monitoring and evaluation in the, the, the presidency um, they've created a project plan and um, taking up all of the recommended actions from the zondo report um, we had to submit um, uh, uh, what we're going to do in terms of of our uh, uh, response to to these recommend, recommended actions but then we also need to quarterly submit follow-up reports and that's been properly monitored in in that office and um, and make sure that the recommended actions or recommended actions coming from the Zondo Commission has been been um, been been looked at and it's been implemented. So the next question in terms of whistleblowers information, uh, we're happy to to work with with yourselves on that. So if there's any information you would want to pass on to the FIC, you're more than welcome. We if you look at at our legislative framework, we can only disseminate information to a law enforcement agency. So we can get information in and we enhance that information of all of our data and then we can hand it over to law enforcement for further investigation. So so you're more than welcome to to receive information from yourself, sit down, understand the, the, the work being done and take that information and hopefully it's not illegally obtained information. So, so that we can take that information forward um, and, and we can track that information through the, the system. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We've got another hand on the side and um, please let's remember that Yanis is also yeah. online. Can so we can field up? questions from him as well. Uh, hello, I'm Paul Graham from the Defend Our Democracy campaign. It's a, it's a bit of a follow-up question. A few years ago, it was clear that the FIC was reporting lots of cases, and then they were just lying in the pending trays of the law enforcement agencies. Now, um, you just said about 300, 3,000 uh, reports. It, does FIC have a, a tracking mechanism that's actually monitoring the outcome of these cases, or is that being left entirely in the hands of the of the law enforcement agencies? Thank you. Sure. Um, so, so if you talk about, and, and I think it's maybe one or two of the recommended actions from the mutual evaluation to say, we we. I mean, there was no finding about the financial intelligence center not producing financial intelligence, but the finding was that they want to see increase of utilization. So what we've done is, uh, in the meantime, from from the FIC side, from 2019, we've started to to, to um, uh, implement what we call a feedback feedback mechanism. So what we do is quarterly, we we will take all of the cases that's been disseminated, make a list of that, and then send that list across to our law enforcement partners. And we expect them um, to to give us feedback on on those matters. But I mean, some of these cases are complex uh, corruption matters, complex fraud cases. So it takes time. But we we've started with that. Um, we've signed uh, MOUs, a memorandum of understanding, with with most of well, all of our strategic stakeholders at least. And in terms of that uh, MOU, they need to provide us some feedback and some updates on on these matters. So we do see that there's there's progress being made in this space. So, so, but what we find is the, the most impact that we are seeing in terms of the work that we are doing as the Financial Intelligence Center is around asset recovery. So what we are doing is you can go to our annual report and, and look at, at the, the numbers that we are reporting in the annual report. 
Um, we, we, what we try to do is when we issue an intelligence report, we are seeing whether the special investigation unit, whether the SARS, whether the, the, the revenue services, um, the, the asset forfeits, whether they're obtaining preservation orders using our financial intelligence. And we track that orders to uh, attach a value to some of the work that we are doing. If you look at the last year, and, and it's a lot of some of the, the, the state capture cases, I think we estimate around 5 billion was recovered using financial intelligence. So, so that will keeping that stats and, and making sure that uh, we, we have um, some of that, that uh, statistics available, we can see that there is impact using the financial intelligence. And that's also one of the reasons why we started the fusion center. So when a person sits in a fusion center with the financial intelligence center, they can't say, but I haven't received your report because they're sitting there, they're the same, accessing the same case management system and the information is on there. They must start using the, the money flows um, uh, 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 evidence or information that we've prepared. So, so that's one of the reasons why we've started the, the Fusion Center. And there's some other initiatives. I don't want to take up too much time. I will also allow the other panel members to come in. Thanks. Uh, thanks once again. My name is Khaukhel, as I've said uh, earlier on. Um, the public and the private sector partnership is very important and it's much needed. But in order for that um, partnership to work, of course, we need a more accountable um, private sector. So my question is, um, how have you ensured that you are not compromised by working with the private sector, which is, well, a few of them are enablers of uh, corruption and money laundering. And, and also, and how have you been um, holding the same private sector that you are working with accountable and if ever you can give us some um, examples. Thank you. Is it getting me? Good. Um, th thanks for that question. Um, so, so we do have uh, what we call a compliance division in the Financial Intelligence Center. Um, they do routine uh, inspections. Um, and if you look at the AML framework in South Africa, we have a joint supervisory model where the, the Reserve Bank are doing um, uh, supervising of, of the sector, like the banks and financial service providers. Then we have the Financial Sector Conducting Authority is also doing supervision in that sector. And if you look at, at the last financial year ago, uh, again, you can go back to, to um, the annual report. I can't remember the exact figures because I don't work with it daily, but I think it was around um, close to 1,000, but it could be 500 inspections that was uh, executed making sure that institutions do comply with our act and making sure um, not only complying with our act, but also issue them with a fine. And, and the examples of these institutions that wasn't compliant or that weren't compliant with the Financial Intelligence Center Act uh, legislation, we're issuing some, some fines. So, so there is a process and, and as I indicated, we're working with the Reserve Bank as well as the Financial Sector Conducting Authority Previously, the estate agency of Facebook were doing some of the inspections around the estate agents. Um, some of that responsibilities, um, and if you talk about the, the legal practitioners, um, they, they've been previously was su supervised by the uh, um, Legal Practitioners uh, Council, the LPC. Now that's also been taken over by the Financial Intelligence Center because we haven't seen uh, too much impact in that space. And, and as I indicated, uh, we, we are doing inspections, if they're not compliant, we, gave, we issued them fines. Also in terms of, of the analysis division where I'm working, if we work on a case and we identify that uh, a specific bank or a specific uh, institution, non-financial institution, wasn't compliant with the requirements of the Act, we do a referral internally to our compliance division and making sure that they then execute an ins inspection and that the necessary consequences then happen subsequent to, to that enforcement action. And again, you can go to the annual report, the stats is in the annual report. Thank you. Um, I know we're sort of running out of time and there's a lot of interest in uh, the work of the FIC. I just, before we kind of close, wanted to bring in Yanis uh, one last time, just with a question about the lessons uh, that you've learned uh, um, in terms of being involved in this public-private partnership. How does it affect, or is there any effect on the way the bank operates in the region? Are you, is, is it possible for you to take some of those lessons and, and implement, and how has that sort of affected uh, the work, uh, the way that the bank works? Uh, in the region and also beyond. 
Yeah, Scarlett, I mean, I, I think from the bank's perspective, um, I suppose it's really just showed us the, the value of the collaboration. Um, you know, really in terms of what we've learned around the way forward is to, the sooner we engage, the better. Um, I think it's also helped us that that we now have, to Peter's point, we have trusted partners. Um, we we regularly work particular type of cases with within Peter's team. Um, you know, just yesterday or last night, we 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 again fast tracked a case uh, into the FRC, and it's you know yes it's into the FRC and yes that's part of a bigger machinery, but you know via that mechanism we we now even engage particularly with some of his team members regularly who have particular expertise in in different types of cases. So. So, so I think the collaboration has also helped us there. Um, but yeah, I think from a, primarily it's really just been sort of speed to market on these. Um, you know, to the previous point raised, um, you know, it, it takes a second to to transmit a, to a payment, and once it's gone, I think the point that you raised is that that it's difficult to get back. So the sooner we can act, and the sooner we can detect, the sooner we can report, and then the sooner we can share that information in the center. Uh, you know, I think the the better, I suppose, for all of us um, within that community. Thank, thank you, Yanis. And I just want to close this panel really quickly with reference to a, a final question uh, from from the online uh, group, which was asking about how lawyers strike a balance between client conf 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 confidentiality uh, in the event uh, of money laundering and the obligation to report. And I would like to just say on that, that to me is a perfect example of where this type of partnership should be coming in. So we see the US has a new, you know, has legislated on this internationally, this will be pushed down. And this is the opportunity, not just for the government to say, you know, to push that further down, but actually say, why don't we come together with the lawyers and discuss how that balance, what that could look like in the different jurisdictions. So I would say this is sort of a perfect example of learning from the financial institutions, learning from some of the other sectors and really coming together to identify how best to move this forward. Because I would say for all of the uh, industries that are uh, involved as sort of like what we call gatekeepers uh, when it comes to money laundering, uh, um, the legislation is gonna come and it's just a question of on which side you're ultimately on and whether you wanna have a seat at the table, or you wanna be part of that discussion and part of, of, of the transition there or not so uh, that's sort of like a little bit of a call to action when it comes to to the lawyers and the accountants etc uh, as a group of industry that that I think uh, also has a big role to play in future in the region and beyond so with that thank you so much to my fantastic panel uh, to everybody here and also thank you so much for MBI, uh, Saib, uh, Covington and all the partners who are involved in putting this together thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Scarlett and the panel. Um, we need to move fast to make up for lost time. And uh, according to the program, we should be taking a break. But we also have um, um, a bit of a time um, constraint for one of our panelists. So what I'm going to suggest, instead of a quick break, if everybody can, we just do a quick energizer. If you can just stand up, stand up, stand up and just turn it around. I think also to use this as a networking opportunity, it's very rare that we get to be in person. It's very rare that we get to be in person. If you can turn around and just introduce yourself to your colleague behind you or next to you, who you are, where you're from. <laughs> Okay, thank you, everybody. I wonder if you can just sit down, and I hope you enjoyed that little bit of uh, networking and introduction. Um, hopefully, when you stay behind for the light lunch, you will have a, a better opportunity also to engage further. We are on our last leg of our journey, the last panel, which focuses on, can I go back? business taking a stand. Um, here we are going to talk more about responsible businesses that are partner partnering with law enforcement and using best practices and tools to ensure ethical leadership starts and continues. Um, on our panel, we have today um, three speakers. 
Um, we have Nazir Hamdulay, who's uh, an executive of risk and compliance at SICA. He's responsible for executing leadership in organization risk management, business continuity management, compliance, internal audit, and combined assurance. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have next to Nazir, we have Carolyn Chalmers. She is the CEO of the Good Governance Academy and the ESG Exchange. Uh, Catalan has spent the last 20 years assisting leaders and leadership teams to understand and apply governance pr principles and generate value for their organizations. Then we have our NBI board member, Sintle Mariani. Sintle is a C-suite corporate governance and legal practitioner with more than 22 years of expertise in strategy execution and senior stakeholder relationship management, um, mainly on behalf of major multinational corporations. Um, do we have Michelle? So Michelle, we have uh, online. Michelle Crimes is the program director for anti-corruption and governance at SIPE, the Center for International and Private Enterprise. Michelle works on a variety of global transparency and integrity initiatives, and she's also involved with corporate compliance. She supports companies in seeking to manage corruption. So we have a diverse panel but very, very experienced. And our moderator for the last leg is our social transformation program unit uh, manager, Chutula. Um, and she's gonna lead us in this exciting journey before we tie up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tevin. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Tevin, for introducing uh, panel three and myself. So I will not reintroduce us, but I will welcome my esteemed panel, panelists, Michelle, Nazir, Carolyn, and Zintle. And thank you for taking the time to sit down with me and unpacking uh, business taking a stand. With that said, our online guests and as well as the guests in the room are probably thinking that the composition of this particular panel um, features and explores industry bodies that are ranging from the associates of business, local and global um, NGO with a focus, strong focus on the private sector. Often these role players, though, are seen as enablers of corruption and not champions of corruption. So the elephant in the room that I'm currently alluding to is captured well in Prof. Gutlu, Wiseman Gutlu's book, Enabler versus Victim. This is his account of his journey together with the leadership of KPMG trying to turn around the trying to turn around company, not rather the country. And um, before we get into the heart of our discussion, what are your thoughts around the elephant in the room and how our guests at the moment are probably perceiving us as the enablers of corruption? I will start with Nazir. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody online and in the room. Thank you for that, uh, Tatula. Uh, back in 2018, I was, I was asked by the then CEO to, to centralize our member compliance function across SICA, where we ultimately hold everybody accountable for maintaining their professional obligations. And, and I'm, I'm really privy to a lot of the information now through the couple of years to actually see uh, the challenges that are being faced by, by chartered accountants, by auditors. And I would, I'm not taking you know, anything away from or giving you too much information about Prof and Kushler's book, but there is very definitely challenges that is being faced by uh, the likes of the auditors to ensure that one, uh, they, they make sure that they hold people to account, but also to make sure that, I mean, they also have to um, drive their business. So, um, you know, it's a tricky question that is the elephant in the room and hopefully we will be able to unpack that even further through throughout the, the conversation. Thank you, Nazir. Yeah. And now I will ask Zintle for your contribution around that. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming through today and um, sharing some ideas in, in and around, uh, you know, corruption practices, unethical behavior, and what it is that we have to share and discuss with you. Um, as, a, as an NBI uh, board member, but also as a practitioner in terms of uh, the law, 
um, maybe just to pay some some respects to who hires me and pays my my paycheck every every month um, as you know a council experience for Africa um, just to kind of like allude to it, I think the NBI has done quite a lot of work uh, together with the private sector, most importantly, but also having brought in as well the public sector just to ensure what it is that we can do. Because when you take a minute and you think about what it is that the NBI stands to do, um, it very much follows its, its, its prescript with regards to why it is in business. And um, one of the key things I remember way back when, actually even before I became a board member, I was still a member uh, company representing Holland at the time. And um, I remember being asked to, 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 to be part of uh, a, a conversation regarding some of the stories and the behind the scenes conversations that were now being had and the unpacking that obviously had happened with regards to KPMG. And the idea started, I remember, at that conversation, so like about four or five years ago. And it is actually quite interesting and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of the NBI as a consequence because I remember seeing the journey from back then whereby these things were being talked about. And um, I know that, uh, sorry, sir, I don't know your name, but I know that that was your question earlier on to say, you know, private sector is an enabler. And those were the conversations that we were having then to say that what is it then that we as the people who are actually part of the problem, how can we seek to resolve it. And I am pleased to state that the NBI working together with different other uh, uh, corporations have come up with a program that seeks to address this and um, i'll talk a little bit more about it in in, in, in my in my conversation later, however. In as much as we've always been viewed as an enabler and possibly the, the instigator as well, because before there is somebody who receives the, the, the bribe, there is somebody giving it. So what is our role then as the, as, as the private sector? What can we do? So for me, it's things like creating awareness. It's things like training. It's things like ensuring that one leads from the top. Our corporate governance practices and processes are in place and we ensure that those things actually are maintained. And systematically, you know, people come through every day and lead by example. Thank you, Tula. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, Carolyn? Ah, oh, me. Thank you. I see Michelle's still online. That's good. Um, very nice being here today. It's lovely seeing everyone in the room and on per in person. And hello to everyone online, where I'm normally online. So this is great for me to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I think this topic is so important from an ESG perspective, actually. Um, if we think about ESG in its broadest sense, is sustainability and sustainability of the organization in society. And um, you talk about the private sector enabling or being complicit. That is counter to sustainability of the entire economic environment. So this is really important from a, a, a whole economic sustainability as well as the whole ESG kind of um, aspect. So putting that aside, uh, it always shocks me how we still have these incidents over and over and over again. We know what the right things are to do. We know it and we can unpack that today. What are the right things that leaders should be doing and leading their organizations? And we know the right way of doing those things. Anti-bribery management systems, procurement, uh, sustainable procurement, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. We know those things. So why does this carry on happening. And I've been asking many people around the world in my various interviews of people, how can you teach ethics? I hear about teaching ethics. And I spoke to this one lady in the UK, and she came up with an analogy I really like, and I'm going to use it today. She said, you know, um, teaching ethics is like sharpening a pencil. Most people have ethics. And uh, sometimes it's really fuzzy. And she talks about, you know, being long changed, you know, not short changed, being long changed. And you smile to yourself and go, oh, I'm lucky instead of giving the money back, right? That's a little <laughs> bit fuzzy. Um, so that's the blunt pencil. But the ethics training is about sharpening that pencil specifically for the organization concerned. 
which is really interesting. She says, but then you do have people that have no lead in their pencil. And I'm sorry, you just have those kinds of people. And I think that's a big challenge we have is trying to find those people where it actually doesn't matter whether you've got accountability, transparency, you understand how to do things, why to do things, what you should be doing. There is just no lead in the pencil. So um, really interesting to unpack that a little bit further in my conversations around the world. So thanks. To Thank you, Carolyn. And um, we're going to move to Michelle, who's joining us virtually. What are your thoughts about the perceived elephant in the room? Thank you so much for having me. I hope you can hear me quite okay. And I'm quite jealous based on how everyone is dressed. It looks like it's far warmer uh, where you are than it is here. Um, my thoughts on this uh, that I always share when I'm asked this question, because SIPE is an organization that is focused on this issue of transparency, into corruption, accountability with the private sector specifically. Um, one of the ways that I always discuss this is I say, you know, we have to have, and you'll hear me say this, ecosystems of um, of accountability and transparency. That is to say that the private sector has to play a role here. Um, you can't um, sort of correct behavior, sort of what Carolyn has already talked about. You can't find those individuals perhaps who don't have lead in their pencil. You will have a difficult time addressing the issue if you exclude um, an entire community. Uh, and given that the private sector is so fundamental to really, for many of us, it's how we pay our bills, it's how we take care of our families, it's how we make sure that we have uh, food to eat and on our table. It's a, a fundamental part of any community. And um, if we are trying to really address the issue, we need to bring in everyone who is part of the problem, whether or not they uh, continue to have the issue, uh, continue to sort of um, be the source of the problem, I think is, um, you know, I think Carolyn addressed that quite well, that there will always be people who will sort of um, engage in this way and you can never sort of get rid of, I think, um, corrupt acts uh, 100 percent. But having the conversation and starting to move the private sector more away from sort of thinking I, we just have to have checklists and we just need to have systems um, and starting to understand that they are a fundamental part of any community and embedding these ideas around accountability and ethics and transparency, I think, moves us uh, into a different conversation. And it's a lot about what, what you hear me talk about. And it's certainly the focus of a lot of the work that SIPE does with the private sector on this issue. Thank you, Michelle. Um, thank you for the, that, these insights, uh, panelists. I think there's no real silver bullet um, to answer that question in essence, but I think the start would be collective action um, and working together broadly with society as a private sector to try and showcase um, a responsible business. Now, I would like to shift gears a little bit and um, address Zinche. Um, as you've mentioned, you're a member of the NBI, board member of the NBI, and corruption in business manifests itself in different forms and influences the sustainability of business and uh, the private sector broadly. What is NBI's approach in ensuring ethical leadership and integrity in business? If I may, uh, Tutula, I, um, I did some work and picked up a beautiful quote by um, uh, Lawrence C. Isley, uh, the star, the star thrower. So the story goes, one day there was a terrible storm and uh, that left many starfish awash on the beach. A young girl who was playing around there obviously sees them and starts picking one at a time and throwing it back into the ocean. Obviously it's the beach and there's a couple of people hanging around and um, a man looks at an amusement and says to her, uh, little girl, what are you doing? You know, there's like so many starfish everywhere. I mean, and you're only just picking up one at a time and throwing it back. What difference are you even going to begin to make? And she's a little disheartened by this. She doesn't address him immediately. She continues picking up one starfish and throws it back into the ocean. And then she says to him, it made a difference to that one starfish. A couple of minutes later, more people actually start seeing this and they start helping. And now everybody's throwing in together with the guy who asked the question. Now that's the NBI's approach. It's one case at a time. It's actually just as simple as that. 
you can make a difference by literally making one change at a time and one person is influenced the right way one step at a time um, it feels like a simple analogy but it's actually just that simple wow thank you um and just in addition to that um I guess that story could be sort of the flagship of the ethical leadership and anti-corruption course, that it's one user at a time that we're empowering. It's one user at a time that we are showcasing what ethical leadership is through the different insights within the course. Absolutely. Nazir, um, as a, an executive um, at SICA, um, I'm sure you can appreciate that um, the professional accountants are essential actors within running the economy as well as business. And SICA has the responsibility of governing its own credibility and ensuring public trust, confidence for the investors, as well as responsible business, um, responsible business through um, best practice and oversight of the financial sector. How do we institutionalize ethical culture within the members of SICA? Thank you. Perhaps I just thought I'd start with that by getting some uh, input from the room firstly, just to, <laughs> to uh, get the juices flowing, but just maybe by a show of hands, um, just to understand the size of, of the Psyche and its members. Who of you believe that we have between the 20,000 members, anything from 0 to 20,000? Nobody in this room. 20 to 40,000 members? Oh, and, yeah, one hand, okay. More than 50,000 members, okay. That's the size, well done. That's the size of, of, of the, the membership base that we have. But here's the follow-up question. How many of those members are actually registered auditors? We only have about 3,500 of those members that are practicing auditors. If you want to go back to the fundamentals of uh, and the purpose, the fundamental purpose of the 55,000 members, then we need to ensure that they, one, always act in the public interest. That is, that is core to the chartered accountancy profession. Core, core, core. And our role as psych is also to always act in the public interest. Acting in the public interest is about all of our chartered accountants and our associates understanding that they have to live our code of professional conduct. And our code of professional conduct is premised on five principles. Integrity, objectivity, professional competence and due care, professional behavior, and confidentiality. So, as an institute, we promote that all the time, that our members have to live by those principles. In addition to that, we, we do a lot in terms of through the, our continuing professional development policies and that ensuring that our members, when we find that members are potentially having difficulty applying certain of those principles, we ensure that we we legislate in a way that it's compulsory to do that. So as an example, back in 2020, we actually made ethics training compulsory on members. They have to demonstrate that they are able to, in those difficult positions, um, apply the right principles when it comes to ethics. So as a professional body, we have not only an obligation to our members, but an obligation to society at large to ensure that we as SICA and our members, the chartered accountants, the associates, actually live those principles all the time. But also, we, our members are found wanting, we need to discipline them accordingly, which, which we do. So um, from that perspective, the institutionalization of ethics is core, not only through the members, but throughout our curriculum. The code of professional conduct applies equally to our trainee accountants. So those that are not qualified chartered accountants, but they're studying towards um, uh, chartered accountancy already. And the way we promote it 
uh, we'll get into that a bit later. Yeah. Thanks, Nazir. I think making the ethics training compulsory sets the tone of, of Saika. Um, Michelle, the relationship between the private sector, law enforcement and regulatory um, authorities is a key aspect of dealing with money laundering and financial crimes that negatively affect South Africa's economy as well as the financial system. What recommendations would you give to the banks and businesses in taking a stand against money laundering and corruption? Thank you so much for asking me this question. And I think I'll talk a little bit more about sort of how I see uh, layers of governance and again, creating ecosystems of accountability. Um, and that means that the private sector can't act alone, civil society, regulators cannot act alone. You need government, private sector, civil society, and approaches should really take um, all of this into consideration and whatever approach you take should be multifaceted. Again, you're trying to create that ecosystem of transparency, of accountability. Um, I think uh, it is really important to um, think about how uh, government and regulators can act in, um, in collaboration and create sort of dynamic feedback loops. Uh, we've talked about, and if I recall properly from the agenda, you've probably talked quite a bit about collective action and how the private sector um, can sort of work together uh, with government to figure out sort of what's happening. Um, I think that this means that you have to, uh, businesses in particularly need to um, understand who their customers are, all of the things that we sort of talk about when we talk about accountability, uh, prioritizing all of the systems that you need internally. Uh, and as I think we'll probably talk about quite a bit here, uh, address the role of gatekeepers, which is why we're here, lawyers, accountants, I'm a lawyer myself. Um, I think that probably systems uh, where I am based, you know, in the United States are quite different different than systems in other parts of the world. But I think we need to take a look at sort of what we're all doing and how we're all engaged and learn the best practices, adapt appropriately for our context, um, and sort of ensure that um, those who are the gatekeepers, those accountants, auditors, again, are not simply giving information about what's happening within the system, but are also sort of have an eye out and understand what's, re what's really happening in terms of accountability, transparency, um, and learn how to sort of work together to create a system to help us all move forward. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Carolyn, in ensuring responsible business practice requires individual accountability, collective accountability, and ensuring um, accountability across all sectors um, develops from the social behavior. So what is important um, What is important of ethics training for responsible practices, I guess, and coupled with that, um, how important is the relationship between law and anti-corruption, and how do law enforcement um, officials develop a framework that holds an ethical behavior to account in leveraging both individual and collective accountability? Mm, thank you. That's a, a very broad question. <laughs> I'll, I'll start off by saying, uh, just referring back to the other speakers. I think, um, you know, the starfish approach, the one at, one at a time, so important, and Michelle mentioned that as well, it takes an ecosystem. So we can all do our little bit and, you know, throw the star back, but it actually takes the ecosystem. And uh, we need to make a difference and help uh, law enforcement, uh, help uh, private sector, public sector, the, the whole ambit of the ecosystem. We need to do this collectively. This is a collective social issue that we need to address. Um, I think what Nasik was saying around the acting in the public interest today, I guess in the private sector, we're acting in the interest of the organization. And I think that gets confused sometimes. We don't always act in the interest of the organization as opposed to uh, acting on self-interest. And of course, in the Companies Act in South Africa, we have that business judgment rule that talks about conflict of interest. So I'll talk a little bit about leadership um, in the context of, of your question, and I'll get to the, to the others later. But in terms of leadership, individual leaders um, and being accountable and demonstrating accountability, I think training is really important. So you have the course that you're launching, um, that you just launched, uh, that's really important to actually get up off your seat and go and take some training. Just because you finished your degree in the 19, 
Okay, I'm not going to go there in the 90s. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> aging myself. Um, yeah, just because you finished your formal education doesn't mean that you need to stop learning. And that's what you said, the CPD, uh, ethics training. The, the world is changing around us and we need to continually learn. So it's an individual leader's responsibility to keep up to date and to keep educated. We know what the right things are to do as leadership. We are guided in South Africa with the King Four Code of Corporate Governance. So we know what the right things are. And although it's very difficult to put ethics and conduct, and you mentioned the code of conduct and ethics is a little bit different from conduct. Um, we know what it is to do the right things. And we have this code um, that guides us, but, and we talk about it being uh, compliance, but in the same breath, we say, you need to behave well. You need to do the right things. Now, how do you go about you know, bring, bringing a legal big stick around that? Oh, I see we've got power back, yay. <laughs> how, do you bring a, how do you use a legal big stick, a legal framework to tell people to do the right things? Yes, there are principles that can be applied, but every circumstance is different. So it needs to be considered in your specific circumstance, in your organization's circumstance. So that's why King 4 is applied on an apply and explain basis because you need but it's a big and complex um, scenario you know how to get the public and the private sector and the whole ecosystem one starfish at a time in the best interest of the organization so i think that's really important to think about that bigger picture as individuals and collectively in leadership Thank Thanks, you, Carolyn, for that comprehensive um, uh, <laughs> contribution. And I agree with you. Um, once again, the issue of behavior pops up. It's not about a tick box exercise. It's about what are the organizational aspects that perpetuate corruption or curb corruption. So, Zinche, um what is, um, or rather, how important is it for business to understand the implications of corruption um, within the socioeconomic development context um, in South Africa? I think across the world, Tutula. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just only here. Um, because we have seen with uh, AML tendencies and practices that obviously money transmits. Uh, we've seen through cybersecurity that um, there's also a lot of transmission of either funds being posited and then used in, in, in precarious uh, 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 ways. Um, and so we know that the problem doesn't only exist here in South Africa, it, it, it's, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, so that's the one part. But the second part is, for me, it's really about creating awareness and, and being able to, to, to know what it is that one needs to look out for. So the detection becomes important. So again, going back to, you know, that ethics course that the Saika has, or the ethics, um, you know, an anti-money laundering course that, um, you know, the NBI has, and various many others, or whatever training programs that you know, companies have um, when you attest every year on the code of conduct, because I know most companies have that, you know, what are you actually attesting to? Do you stop to actually think to read or is it also just a tick box, you know, exercise, you know, um, you know, compliance is not going to come back to me and ask me whether I've done it or not, because you know what, I tick the box. Are you actually reading? Uh, because within that code of conduct, for most instances in most companies, you'll find the whistleblowing policies. You will find the policies regarding, um, you know, those those calls. What are they called? Um, uh, you know, when somebody makes a, an anonymous call, tip off calls. Yes, there's a lot that companies are doing. But is it actually driven from the top? Are the leaders actually walking the walk? Um, do you see the practices flow throughout? I mean, as a lawyer, I sometimes stop, stop to think um, how basic it is when I'm looking at an agreement. And in the bigger scheme of things, my job is to ensure that the interests of the company that I work for are protected and supported. So as I actually review and or negotiate on a contract, I'm thinking, what can we do here to maximize and get the best possible deal for the company? There's nothing wrong with that, right? Or is there? 
Is there a way that we can actually look at it from a basic concept perspective and say to ourselves, actually, in me being ethical in my approach, even in something as simple as negotiating an agreement, is there a need for me to actually try to do it in the other party? I can do everything I need to do, protecting my company, maximizing on whatever I need to maximize on, but without breaching that line. So for us as the NBI, for us as the private sector, for me, it's being very, very clear with regards to creating that awareness and always being, it, it, it needs to be topical. It needs to be the conversation that is being had. It can't be a once in, a, 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 it can't be an annual thing that we are doing. So that consistent reminder that we are doing, um, it obviously for me starts from you know, top leadership uh, and, and ensuring that we as a business have got a culture that, that supports what ethical leadership is, um, that actually encourages and supports those, 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 those whistleblowers, um, that supports those people who, who are able to say, no, wait, this doesn't sound right. Can I go ask somebody? They should be, that should be encouraged and, and supported by businesses. So to Tula, long story short, for me, those are the things that we need to do. It is not only just having processes and systems and policies in place, but it is actually actively engaging them to ensure that people actually understand what it is that we're trying to achieve or whatever is actually out there. Thank you, Zintle. Um, and just to add to that, you brought up a lot of interesting points in your in your response. Um, I'll hone into leadership and the tone from the top. It's also important to understand the legitimacy of that tone. And you mentioned a little bit around consistency and in order to support the values, the vision of the entity, when the um, employees are blowing the whistle, are there structures to support that kind of narrative as well? Um, I am aware that you need to run away from us soon. So um, we have two minutes, but I will move to Nazir now. Um, and see what Nazir can, how can you try and, and, and respond to this particular question? So Carolyn um, alluded to it earlier about, we know what to do. We have the thinking faculty to choose between right and wrong. It's another story what you actually do decide in a closed room by yourself with nobody else looking as the just mentioned. But um, when there is fault, who, who, who's accountable? Is it the accountants? Is it the structure? Is it um, the entire body? Who do we, who do we blame? Yes, no, thanks for that. <laughs> I think, I mean, let's go back in history and why auditors and chartered accountants were held in such high esteem. It was because they were the ones that spoke up against malfeasance. They were the ones that spoke up against corruption without fear or favor. That is what ultimately got the CA, got the auditor to be the custodian and being perceived as the custodian of ethical behavior, integrity in the past by the public. Having said that, there are multiple governance structures within or any organization within the organization that all has the responsibility to ensure that there is ethical behavior from the board that sets the ethical tone all the way through to executive management that is responsible for detection of fraud as well as the other assurance pro providers throughout that being internal auditors, external auditors and other assurance providers. So coming back to the three and a half thousand auditors that it makes up of, there's a big, there's a big misconception, I guess, in the public that the auditor is solely responsible for the detection of fraud. Their responsibility is actually not to take hundred percent of of, of transactions. It's ultimately management and the collective responsibility to put things in process to ensure that we can identify that, um, that, that corruption. So I believe that there are responsibilities for each and every layer and governance layer to root out, identify and root out corruption um, in that entire ecosystem. Thanks, Nazir. I see we have Michelle back. Uh, Michelle, 
How do we reinforce oversight, transparency, accountability within various stakeholders and the effective execution of justice when it comes to money laundering and corruption? So, well, I'm glad to be back. It looks like you lost me for just a bit of time here. So uh, I'm sad that I missed some of the conversation that we all had, but I hear already sort of talk about um, layers of transparency and accountability. And I think that there are really sort of two things that I would like to sort of talk about around that a little bit. One, uh, they sort of focus on a bit of the work that site does. One, I'm sure as you've already heard, is um, our Ethics First program, which is run by my colleague Lola Adekanye, who you would have spoken to earlier. But that sort of fits into the idea of the private sector coming together as a community, right? To say, we are ethical, we are being transparent about our processes, we are engaging uh, in business in a way that is above the board, right? And it's sort of moving towards what I think I've heard everyone speak about in terms of individuals and uh, a sort of collective action together. We are uh, behaving in a way that um, we hope will improve society and, and prevent, uh, you know, um, money laundering and criminal activity. Um, I think the other layer that happens is what um, another area that site focuses on, which is beneficial transparency ownership, uh, which is really important. Um, it helps everyone to understand who controls assets, who benefits from an asset. Um, and again, it provides layers of clarity, of a transparency. Um, we can know if a politician owns an actor, we can learn. Uh, it might prevent criminals from using a business to launder money. It might prevent tax evasion. And if nothing else, it can make really clear who is benefiting um, from a particular transaction. Um, it creates the transparency that we really want a, around um, accountability, uh, I'm sorry, around financial flows. Um, and again, it creates what I would describe as, you know, this, uh, this ethical ecosystem, a community, if you will, of uh, within the private sector, which is attempting to be uh, transparent and accountability and, uh, and accountable. And what I think is even more important is it creates what I would describe as a dynamic feedback loop. Um, so sort of to speak to the point of you know, not just checkboxing, um, redoing for whistleblowers. It can create, um, I think, a mechanism between civil society, between regulators, between the private sector, where it's sort of not someone just reporting and something dies, you know, or it goes to, you know, into a black hole. There's someone who's reading that and everyone is engaging in a certain way that can sort of help push us forward. And I think uh, the work that we try to do um, really focuses on um, creating these systems. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I like that term, ethical um, ecosystem, where um, one particular uh, a stakeholder can act as a bridge between government, the private sector, as well as broader society. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, so one last question on your side. Um, what are the legal frameworks um, that need to be established to ensure unethical behavior is dealt with at the root, in your opinion? Right. So I'm coming at this from a non-legal perspective because I'm not the lawyer. Um, the lawyer sitting over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm also not the policeman. Uh, I come at this from a governance perspective. And the governance perspective is about well doing the right thing, because um, we can have laws in place, we can have frameworks. Um, if we have laws and we set out what the code of conduct is, what the minimum social requirements are in society is a societal code of conduct in law, we need somebody to police that. Who is that somebody? Is it our police force? Are they, are, are they going to be policing what's happening in, in the boardroom, the closed boardroom doors? Are, are we getting that kind of policing? Do we have, well, we've got the URBA um, in the auditor side of things. We've got SACA looking at the, the kind of policing of the accountants. But I do believe we need to think broader than just punitive measures. We have seen punitive measures um, in Sarbanes-Oxley in the US uh, around governance, specifically compliance-based governance, and lots and lots of money was spent. We still see failures. Why are we seeing failures? 
Is it a more improved, a better legal framework that we're needing? I would say not. Um, we actually need a cultural shift. And that we hear about the tone from the top, the fish rots from the head, all of those kinds of things. But there is a need for a cultural shift. And that's not as easy as putting in new laws. That's not as easy as putting in a code of conduct. That's not as easy as clicking your att attestation on an annual basis or putting in your King 4 report on, on the same as last year with the three crossed out and the four put in now. It actually is concerted effort. It is a concerted effort to shift the culture. Mm -hmm. And we need everybody involved to do that. Mm -hmm. So how do we get everybody involved? How do we get a rallying force? And that I think is NBI. NBI is one of the vehicles to rally the private sector together to say, yes, we've got this course, but it's not good enough to just have this course. You actually need to participate and we need to see outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big shift from we went from, and I'm talking from a governance perspective again, a compliance based governance approach in Sarbanes Oxley and the US to a principled based approach. And now the King 4 uh, report was world leading and we have it embedded in ISO 37,000 is an outcomes based approach. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to assess the governance of an organization, you no longer say, are you applying this principle and how are you applying it? Are you? No, you look at the outcomes and you ask the stakeholders, Do you, is this organization demonstrating an ethical culture? Is it is stewarding its resources appropriately? Do you get that sense? Is there transparency around those things? Now, that is a different approach mm -hmm. to the punitive legal framework. And I do believe we need to have the overlay. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, we need to specify the minimum societal or social expectations, and that's captured in a legal framework. Mm -hmm. This and no more. But beyond that, we need to shift our culture into a non-punitive cultural shift in doing the right things mm -hmm. and behaving well. And that requires every one of us to enforce that, to say, point it out. Yes, you, your report actually is pretty, okay, I need to use the right term now. It's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very good. Look at what you're doing. And we need to call that out. Mm -hmm. That isn't shareholder activism. Mm -hmm. That isn't uh, even stakeholder activism. That's a cultural shift mm -hmm. in saying, that's not right what you're doing. Now it circles back to the elephant in the room, what you were talking about. And you were talking about the whistleblowing, protective disclosures, um, actually embracing our auditors when our auditors tell us that something is not right. Embracing our whistleblowers when they tell us something is not right. Being able to tell a, um, you know, a waitron, I see I'm getting the language right, right? A rate waitron, uh, that the meal is actually not right and calling the manager because the manager actually should know, but doing it in a way that's collectively for bettering of society, not a punitive approach. Well, mm. that is, <clears throat> in my personal opinion, <laughs> let me not put the Good Governance Academy, Prof, Prof King's Good Governance Academy and the ESG exchange hats on, but that's my personal approach is we need to look beyond just this minimum societal requirements of ethics, of anti-bribery, of fraud, of behaving well. We need to look in doing our best individually as organizations and as a society in the best interest of South Africa Inc. We need to do that. Thanks. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one more question to um, Zinche as well as Nazir. Um, in response to you, Carolyn, I think um, I agree with you definitely. Um, a lot of stakeholders need to partner with the NBI <laughs> and push um, collective action and the mandate of, of doing the right thing mm -hmm. um, and being inclusive and in doing that and fair representation in how we build those working groups or structures to, 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 to process um, the, the agenda. Now, Nazir, um, within that line of thinking, um, what is Saika's plan to restore um, public trust and confidence um, to ensure ethical leadership um, within the profession? There's a few things that we've done already since uh, 2018, but let me start with the punitive measures. 
So, so yes, it's very important to have the punitive measures, but also what we've done is we've made it publicly available. So the results of every single case of a chartered accountant that has been found to you know, um, contravene the code of professional conduct has actually been published. Mm. In addition to that, you can actually, at the moment, log in to the current hearing of the SAA director, Ms. Quinana. It's currently happening at the moment that the psychodisciplinary hearing is happening and you can actually log in and watch that case if you'd like to. So punitive measures is very important and we've enhanced and changed our bylaws and our constitutions to ensure greater transparency mm. in that process. Furthermore, what we do is, to your other point, uh, Carolyn, is we are celebrating those members and those people in the public that actually do speak out. These guys, we've hosted Ethel Williams in what mm -hmm. under the Unite Form Zanzi initiative that is for Psyche, where we're saying let's get this conversation going. Let's collectively, as business, as chartered accountants, and any other stakeholders that's willing to collaborate with us and make South Africa Inc. better. We celebrate our members, the trainee accountants that are actually out there trailblazing. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting the good stories out, saying that it's actually not only a few rotten bad apples, you know, that has, has, has affected the entire profession. Um, the, the one of the big challenges, though, is that we're not an organ of state. So the disciplinary process takes quite long mm. because we rely on other organs of state for information. But I can say that we have never actually lost any of our cases that went on appeal where we disciplined our members. And then circling back to the elephant in the room being the whistle blowing issue. I mean, we've lost two of our members. Two of our members have paid the highest price. They lost their lives for, 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 for blowing the whistle. Um, and, and to that effect, we partner with people and organizations like the Whistleblower House and we support them and work with them collaboratively to ensure that you know that kind of message gets out that we can then offer services to our members and a platform where members could potentially feel a lot safer to actually um, blow the whistle mm. so back in 2017 2018 uh, we commissioned an independent research by ask africa to actually say what is the trust in the chartered accountancy profession, what is the trust in, in Saika as the organization? And back then, this is when, you know, the Gupta scandals started to hit. The trust in the chartered accountancy profession was in the lower 80s. In Saika was in 75%. Oh. I mean, that's, that's, that's very low. Yeah. And we've just recently gotten our results. So some these initiatives are starting to bear fruit and both now is north of 80%. 85%. Um, so, so there's still a lot of work to do to Tula, but we are continuing to ensure that through these punitive measures, through the changes in policies, through showcasing what our members are actually doing, um, that, that we will ultimately regain the trust uh, of the public because ultimately uh, we need to demonstrate and, and live the values of integrity, objectivity, professional behavior, so that members and the, the public know that when they deal with a chartered accountant, when they deal with an auditor, they can trust them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Naziria. That is very exemplary. And um, excuse the pun, but uh, thank you also for setting the bar <laughs> <laughs> for us. I've just been informed that um, we need to move straight into the Q&A. We're losing a lot of time, um, as well as losing Zintle as well <laughs> for that particular session. So can we have the Q&A um, session now? Thank you. Thanks, Tutula. Um, I think we'll follow the same process. We'll take a question at a time. Um, perhaps we should start with an online question. Are the online people back up? No, nothing. Okay. Three questions from the floor. Let's take middle, right, and left. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trisha Naidu. I work in Love Up in Namibia. I just wanted to ask a question, basically. Do we think that we should engage in relooking at a value-based education system instead of the current system that we have? 
And maybe that might be an ECD where we're saying early childhood development, where we're inculcating, fostering and promoting a system of educare rather than just education, because I think that would speak directly to character build. It is also often said that the end of education is character. So I think we need to just backtrack a bit and look at, instead of putting out the punitive measures that are there, and like uh, Caroline has said, that we have the ISO 37000, all the policy procedures, all the governance scenarios are already written. So why is it that we are forcing this issue as a case of catch me if you can? Yeah. You know, so maybe we should look at the education system and early childhood development, taking back on character build. That will have a long effect it might take some time but we guarantee to create a society that's more culturally strong and value-based than just going after the number scenario i just want to read out a spiritual narrative if i may so it goes like this awake oh man your days are numbered no place to hide anymore as the kali yuga era draws to an end and the dawn of the golden age is upon us all the greed, corruption, egoistic leadership, money laundering, together with all the tainted policy, procedures, and systems, are coming out of the woodwork like never before, exposed. This is due to the conscious shift of conscience from adharma to dharma, which means from falsehood to truth, from selfishness to selflessness. Karma is the law of the universe, not of a country not the law of a country. Africa's clarion call is for transformation of our leadership with love, honesty, integrity, corporate governance, and responsibility with accountability. Thank you. Love it. Yeah. So let's give that one to Michelle. So I think that um, one of the areas where SIPE also works is with uh, youth, with the youth, and we work on starting with, um, I would say, uh, entrepreneur youth, specifically in emerging markets, and we work on just this issue, uh, teaching them, one, how to be entrepreneurs, but in the background, also teaching them how to be ethical and transparent, and really pointing out to them in our programming how corruption uh, sort of takes away from the very thing that they're trying to do, which many people, you know, you have a small business, you become an entrepreneur to better your life in some way, shape or form. And uh, when there's corruption, uh, it can really detract from the purpose of, of whatever it is you might be trying to achieve through your own personal business. So I would agree with you in many ways that sort of, um, you know, the catch me if you can uh, approach to in a lot of ways and the legalistic approach to this issue um, is probably not the only way that we can approach things. It's also sort of what site focuses on, as I've told you before, um, we really look at trying to make sure that we're engaging across the private sector in many different ways it includes, you know, working with women to uh, empower them, working with youth, uh, our programming with ethics first, beneficial ownership transparency, and sort of having multiple layers, again, where we're looking at this issue, and of course, youth would be included in that issue. And that approach, apologies, that issue. Thanks, Michelle. Can I just say something? Sure, Carolyn would like to also. That's, that's sustainability, what you're mentioning. That's long-term value creation. That's long-term thinking, is we do need to start at the bottom, <laughs> as opposed to the top, as well as the top. But start at the root, at the next generation. Mm -hmm the next generation of leaders so we do have that long-term sustainable view I, I really like it yeah thank you um once for those who don't know Musilo um, Mutepu um state capture whistleblower and author of uncaptured good afternoon and thank you for the panel um how do you strike a balance between professionals I mean just look at one instance where the, the financial crisis, you had the rating agencies. And then there were not there were no punitive damages. Yeah. Mm. What happened was people lost their houses. 
So, and there was a talk about reform, but there has, no been, there has not been reform. Um, how do you now, as an auditor, I'm your client and I pay you and you want repeat business. So how do you now strike a balance between that fee that you want to be repeated every year and that sense of independence? And also, I have a different view with the punitive. The reason why we had state capture, and as recent as now, the PPE scandal, is because karma in South Africa has been upside down. Um, all the whistleblowers had some kind of problems. Um, there is no culture of being embraced. You are shunned, you are unemployed, uh, you're criminally charged, civilly charged. Um, you spoke of our, my, our friend and brother, Ethel Williams, he, he's had to run and flee for the country. Uh, so we need, a, we need, I think, a stick and a carrot in terms of ethical leadership. We need from a child, child early development as well, yes, that there is, human, you will get penalized if you do wrong. So if you have a triple A, and then there is defaults. You have to now go to Fetch or Standard and Poor and a very big, sizable chunk of their revenue, not just uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 an instance where 30 million rand was said ex expenses. Did that company pay for uh, were their reparations? Were they punitive? So I think it starts there. And uh, I, I like your, your philosophy. I will just say a decision that. I decided there was 250 people at Trillion, and there was only myself and it, secondly Bianca. And this is what made me blow the whistle. This was in the midst of the Gupta um, power, and Nena was getting fired, and ministers were being chopped and changed to enable the Guptas to get business. And this is what made me do it. Number one, it was this the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good man or woman Keep to quiet. do nothing. Yeah. So I asked myself, am I a good woman? And I looked at myself and I looked at my mother and my God, and I said, yes, I am. So it starts with that internal moral compass. And unfortunately, a lot of people are complicit and they're greedy. So you can have all the legislation, but as long as um, there, there are no penalties, but also there has to be the, like, like an American model where you incentivize whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. So when I, for example, um, I have a case right now, it's Transnet and Trillion, the fee uh, is around close to 90 million. Had, had, had we had those regulations where a whistleblower blows a whistle and they get a certain part portion of it, like in the US, let's say 10%, I would easily have 9 million rand right now. But and I'm happy that I, when I was at the Zondo Commission, I did say have something like that. And the president, when he did give the implementation uh, plan, uh, he agreed with that. So I think we, we, it's, um, we need a, it's, it's not one solution. It's, 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 it's um, I, I like the speaker who, who said it was, it's, um, it's, it's like a, a cycle. So everybody has to play their part. And um, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Hello. I think that deserves an applause. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if, if I might, my colleague, Lola. And thank you for sharing from the heart yet. as well. I don't know if you hear me. Okay, who do, who do you want to direct it to? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks. And uh, yeah, thank you for sharing with us there. Mm. Um, there's a lot of moves at the moment to ensure that within the auditing professions happening overseas as well, that the, the audit arm of business actually gets divested from, let's call it the consulting arm, because audit has to be completely independent. It's a so, so there is those incentives coming now. So many of the firms are looking to, to split. But even before that, what the firms and the auditors have to do is even understand, do I 
even want to accept this client on this at the start of the process regardless of you know when once they've actually won it and that has to happen in the context of are there any association risks with this client do i know what this client actually is up to are there any skeletons in the closet already that i don't actually want to be associated with this client because we've seen what happened with the end runs of this world i mean it wiped out in one of the largest audit firms at the time um, a good couple of years ago but at the end of the day it is up to the auditors to make sure that they stick to those principles of ethics integrity objectivity confidentiality and and the move away from from being driven like on the consultancy side which is very much profit driven but actually offering that service to the public of 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 giving assurance to the to, to the to the public that whatever is in the financial statements in the integrated report is is reliable so um i'm also very optimistic uh, about the future of the profession and I believe that you know the auditors and the accountants out there um, especially the if you see what's happening in our in our pipeline our younger members you know they 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 are over this I mean you know they, they they can't deal with this anymore they say look what you guys have done to the profession pointing to the older okay. older members and they say you know enough enough is enough so mm -hmm. um, yeah I think it's it's about everybody uh putting the pressure keeping the pressure and then ultimately building building the country south africa mm. inc again the, if, if i can just at the good governance academy mm. we have host colloquia twice mm. a year and our colloquium on the 11th of may it's all online is on the mind the gap mm. the yeah, expectation, expectation gap yes. between the public and and the um, auditing profession and accountants so really interesting but to go to your point about incentives absolutely agree that a financial incentive is one incentive i love your um showcasing people who have done well that's another incentive mm. people some some are driven by you know public disclosure of you know i did well um others financially in fact a combination would be great mm. <laughs> and and that recognition that you've done the right thing if we move then to the disincentive um, it can't it, equally, it can't just be a financial disincentive for an organization. It can't just be jail time. It has to be a combination. And here I'm just going to be very quick. But as a mother, two very different children of three, one was an introvert. So telling him he couldn't see his friends was no punishment. In fact, that was a reward. Yay, I don't have to go see my friends. The other one, if I said you couldn't, it was disaster. And just equating that now in, in a professional setting in the private sector, and no names mentioned, but we were busy crafting an outsourcing arrangement. My background is in IT governance, uh, crafting an outsourced arrangement. And then the punitive measures, now we're going to put in, uh, you know, you have to pay so much if you fail to meet certain targets. Eventually, we, the client, we're rescuing the service provider change that a little bit and say, actually, when you don't satisfy this, mm. we're going to put out a full page double spread in the days of the newspapers. Okay, that was a while ago. Um, color spread about the fact that you failed us and you failed all of our clients. That was such a disincentive that never happened again. Mm. <laughs> so we have to talk to the right incentives and disincentives. They're not the same for everyone and for every situation. Mm. So love the combination and i think we need to always be innovative and in thinking of combinations thanks thank you uh, carolyn nazir and michelle for your inputs um around the um q a and all the questions that were posed um in the interest of time we have to close um and i'll just uh, wrap up by saying that i think um business taking a stand um, to encourage business. It's important to um, think of building trust and accountability. Business cannot operate in isolation, partner with like-minded organizations, as well as in general, um, it's important that 
we invest in the values within our organization because we need courageous leadership, courageous leadership to fight corruption. And therefore, we need to know what to do, how to do it, and the guidance is within the culture and um, what is um, displayed within our frameworks within the organization. So I'd like to thank my panelists for joining us, um, as well as our partners, Basil, Converton, and SIP, SIP, for um, this opportunity for today. And now I'll hand over back to our program director. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Tula. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Yes, Dr. Kosman is online. Okay. I, I know I said this, this was the last leg. There's still a little leg to go. It's our final part of the program. Thank you so much for your patience and bearing with us, especially with the knock on effect of load shedding and starting late. We have Dr. Kosman, Dr. JC, JT Kosman online, where he's going to motivate us and inspire us for a call to action. Um, can we plug him? There we go. Welcome to South Africa, to Joburg <laughs> online. Sound? Brilliant. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oh. Kassman. You can go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much. You'll forgive me. My cat wants to be part of the presentation. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I want to thank you all for having me here today, just to level set, so I understand correctly. You've had this extraordinary day. You've learned a lot. You've had these tremendous speakers who have gotten to listen to. You have all this wonderful information. We're running a little bit behind schedule. You're on your way to lunch, and the only thing standing between you and lunch is me to take up a few minutes of your time. So no pressure at all. Let's see what we can talk to you about. You know, I'll tell you, I had an entire speech plan for you that I've completely thrown out because the speakers have been so brilliant and, and almost more brilliant without taking anything away from the speakers have been some of the questions, some of the input, some of the responses that I've heard from some of the participants. Uh, you overwhelmed me. Uh, you were talking about exactly what I had intended to talk to you about. And so instead of notes and, and a lecture, uh, I'm going to just tell you a little bit of a story. And I'm going to tell you a story about, uh, well, me. I'm going to tell you some of my past and, and why this matters to me and why I think it should matter to you. Uh, I have had an extraordinary career. Uh, I have been the, a C-level executive with not one but two Fortune 50 companies. I uh, have founded three very successful companies. I am an investor. I've had a chance to work with everyone from President Obama on down uh, and had this great, wonderful, uh, very uh, privileged life. But it didn't start that way. I started out actually as a homeless kid living on the streets of New York. I lived uh, primarily in the park behind the New York Public Library and spent my days inside the library trying to keep warm during the winter and relatively cool in the summer. One of the consequences of that was I was semi-adopted by the librarians who uh, were basically the keepers of the card catalog. And they were in charge of the library. And they also appointed themselves as the matrons of my education. And so they would continuously feed me books. Well, one of the first tranches of books they they fed to me when I was nine years old and here I am a nine-year-old kid living on the streets and, and living in a library and they decide that I should learn about me and about my circumstance because see at the time I was one of the invisible people I was one of the people who society forgot and society didn't care about and they, they thought I should learn more about what it means to be one of those invisible people and so they gave me a couple of books to read. The first one they gave me was a book called Invisible Man. It was a novel that was written in 1952 by Ralph Ellison. And it's the story, if you haven't read it, it's the story of a young college educated black man who finds himself struggling to survive and succeed in a racially divided society that refused to see him as a human being. See, this was the early 1960s when they shared this book with me. 
And at the time, while apartheid began to end in the 1990s in South Africa, apartheid actually began to end in the US just in the 1960s. I'll argue that both countries and most countries still saw it from a form of sort of an economic apartheid. But as a consequence, we had a vast segment of our society that was, and I'll argue remains, largely invisible. And it really impressed upon me this notion that there were those of us who were truly not seen within our society. Well, the other book they gave me was Plato's Republic. And in the Republic, if you'll remember, uh, I'll bring you back to your early education if you had a chance to read it. And if you didn't, I, I highly recommend it. But in book two, uh, the, Plato tells the story of a conversation between his teacher Socrates and a man named Glaucon. And Glaucon is telling him this myth. And it's the myth of the story of the ring of Gyges. And the way the story goes, there is a shepherd who's out tending his flock in the field. There's a huge earthquake. The ground opens up and he looks in and he sees a skeleton and the skeleton has a ring on its finger, this beautiful gold ring that he takes for himself. And he takes the ring and he puts it on his finger. He goes back to the camp where all the shepherds are gathering in the evening. And as he's sitting there listening to their stories, he's fiddling with the ring and he realizes he's made himself invisible. They can't see him. They, can't, they don't know that he's there anymore. He fiddles the ring back and he's visible again. Brilliant. What a wonderful power. Well, what does he do with this power? The shepherd uses this power to make himself invisible and he goes to the capital city where he seduces the queen, he murders the king, and he takes over the country. And that's the end of the story. And this leaves me terribly upset, frankly, because I'm thinking, well, where's the moral imperative here? This is awful. And in fact, Glaucon, the man who's telling the story, maintains to Socrates that the shepherd was right. That that's what everyone should do. If you could become invisible, if you couldn't be held to task, to consequence for what you've done, you should take advantage of that. And Socrates' response, uncharacteristically, leaves me, frankly, upset and wanting. Because Glaucon, Socrates says to Glaucon, well, basically, you just shouldn't do that. You should be more moral, and the moral man wouldn't do that. And so here is this terrible story that I read when I'm nine years old and stays with me for years and years because I know it's wrong. I know there must be a reason why you shouldn't be able to take advantage of invisibility, why you shouldn't be able to do wrong as long as you're not going to be caught, why there needs to be something bigger than that, and it needs to be more than simply being a moral imperative simply because society tells you you shouldn't, because your parents tell you you shouldn't, even because the religion tells you you shouldn't. There should be something more than that. And this vexes me and it stays with me all through my time growing up. Well, fortunately for me, I happened to meet a bunch of extraordinary people in life. Uh, my friends tease me that I'm essentially a real-world forest gump. I'm this hapless idiot who meets these extraordinary people and and... To, but to my credit, I actually listen and I learn from them. And one of the people I listen to and I learn from is a fellow named Warren Buffett. And I happen to meet Warren Buffett while my uh, life is changing quite a bit. I'm going from a, a, a very different life for myself. I was a police officer, a paramedic, and then I was a soldier. I was very badly wounded. And so now I went back to college and I got my degrees and I was going to teach. And in fact, I was going to teach in the MBA program and I was going to teach about strategy. And so I was talking to Warren, I happened to meet Warren Buffett, a friend arranged an appointment for us. And I'm talking to him and I brought up this story, which of course he knit. Uh, he's a, a voracious reader. He reads something like 300 books a year. And I Talk to him about this and, and, and what my takeaway was and how much it upset me. And the point Buffett made to me was the reason that we should conduct ourselves ethically and morally and in the right way is nothing to do with morality. 
It has nothing to do with ethicality. It has to do with it's the smart thing to do also. It's the smart thing to do for your business and in your business. Why, I asked him. Because it turns out strategic differentiation is a mess. Anything that one company can do, another company can do. If you can do something, someone else will claim they do it better. And they will do it cheaper and they'll do it faster. And eventually, they'll be able to put you out of business. The one thing they can compete with you on is reputation, is who you are. And the market rewards and punishes reputation. See, every business, every company, even every organization, he made the point to me, leaves tracks in the snow and in the sand. You can't conduct yourself visibly, entirely, and perpetually, and forever. Even the shepherd would leave tracks in the snow and the sand. And those tracks have become increasingly visible over the years. And in fact, that's what a large part of my work has been about. My work has been about making those tracks more visible, being able to share and to show to the world what those tracks are. I've used those abilities to be able to track criminal networks, terrorist organizations, people who, working in South Africa, are engaging in fraud, waste, abuse, corruption, and also to ensure the equitable distribution of resources. But what I've found very consistent with what some of the last panelists and the last guests had been talking about in this last session was it's not just about yielding and wielding bigger and better sticks, it's also about carrots. It's also about incentivizing, about showing that we can be seen and as a consequence of being seen, we can be more effective in our organization. And so what I'm gonna ask of you is I'm gonna ask for a call to action. I'm gonna ask you to commit. And what I'm gonna ask you to commit to by a show of hands, whether you're live in the room, I'd ask you to raise your hand. And if you're on Zoom, I'd ask you to click on that little button that raises your hand. I want you to commit to not put on that ring of gaijis, to not hide, to make yourself transparent, to make yourself visible, to share with the world what you're doing because you're proud of it, because it distinguishes you, because it gives you that advantage. I want you to commit, and here's what I want you to raise your hand to. Will you commit to see and to be seen? Will you commit to seeing those people who we have been overlooking, those people who we've overlooked as a consequence of their gender, their ethnicity, their religious persuasion, their sexual orientation, whatever the case may be, those people we've closed our eyes from historically, will you commit to seeing those people and will you as an organization commit to not putting them on that ring and to be seen, to be transparent, not because it's the right thing to do, but because it's also in your interest, in the interest of the society, not just the stakeholders, the shareholders, but the stakeholders you serve. That is the commitment I'll ask of you. And what I'll also ask of you is to have a good lunch and have a good day. Thank you so much for your attention and your time. We still raise our hands. <laughs> uh, we're now done. Um, I have perhaps three words. This was rich, it was inspiring, it was powerful. Um, and if, like me, you leave disrupted, I think this event has been a success. So I thank you all online and on site um, for being here. Um, lunch is being served there. Um, NBI, we will stick to our principles. We please um, ask of you to return your name tags because we recycle them. We are responsible for the earth, one na name tag at a time. <laughs> Thank you all so much. We really appreciate your presence. Thank you. Wow. Thank you.